Recycle only. Just those stumps. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. Okay. All right. I, now I see where you're at. What's your now for? Yeah, ready? Ready when you are. Let's go. Okay. Go ahead, Sherry. Council workshop meeting, Monday, June 5th, 2023, 6 p.m. Bayer? Here. Briggs? Here. Coulter? Here. Heidrich? Here. Holtmeyer? Here. Patkey? Here. Reed? Wessels? Here. Please rise for the pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Will all the committee members answer if they have or have not read the minutes of the meeting dated May 1st, 2023? Bear? Yes. Briggs? Yes. Coulter? Yes. Heidrich? Aye. Holtmeyer? Aye. Patkey? Yes. Wessels? Aye. I need a motion, please. We'll make a motion to approve. Second. Motion <clears throat> by Bear, second by Holtmeyer. All those in favor say aye. 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 Minutes are approved. Presentations, renewal of city's property, casualty insurance, and payment authorization. Amy DeVlossi is here from Daniel and Henry. She's gonna be giving you a, a summary of um, our new quotes for insurance for the next year. As you know, we start this, uh, it's effective July 1st through June 30th of every year. So I'll let Amy take it away. Good evening. I'm up Hi, first, yeah. huh? You're up first. <laughs> I'm Amy DeBlasi from Daniel and Henry. Um, nice to see you all. The uh, property and casualty renewal is ready, so it will be effective June 30th um, if you approve it. Uh, just some general remarks. Um, when looking at the uh, preparations for comments, I wanted to remind myself of what happened last year. So last year, we actually saved $2,810. We squeaked by with a flat renewal last year. Um, and that uh, we had that decrease even when we factor in the excess earthquake coverage that the city chose to purchase last year. So that was a good deal. Um, the main reason we got a decrease last year was because of our workers' compensation claims experience modifier that we kind of tend to talk about every year. Um, last year, Prior to last year, we were at 1.17, and we improved to 0.88. So that was a big improvement. Uh, it saved about $41,000 last year, and it helped to kind of offset some of the increases that we had going on. Um, this year is a little bit of a different story. So we do not have a premium decrease this year. We have an increase in total of 12.3% over last year. Um, so I just wanted to kind of comment on a few lines and give you kind of some background on the reasoning for the increase. So Travelers is your current carrier for property, general liability, auto liability, law enforcement liability, crime, and the umbrella policy. Um, Travelers is very positive, offered a good renewal. Daniel and Henry recommends that you remain with, with travelers with one exception, and that is on the property. So the property, um, the city has been with travelers for two years now. We moved it from Chubb, and travelers was very competitive um, at that time. But <coughs> Chubb was also an excellent partner, in my opinion. They paid some really large claims on the city. Particularly, we had a big uh, storm claim with a lot of roofs being replaced, and, and Chubb did a good job. Um, when travelers started to buy up the property exposures for a lot of different public entities, in my opinion, I think they overdid it a little bit. They just took on too much property. And in the last two years, with all the storms that have occurred, particularly a lot of hailstorms in the Midwest, I think that they think they have too much property. So what they have done for all public entities in Missouri is to add a $250,000 wind hail deductible. 
And what we did was to try to find a way to not have that. <laughs> we don't want that. So um, Chubb was aware, um, made them aware back in December that that was going to be the plan with travelers. And Chubb has been competing to get your business back for four months now. And they're very eager to get it back on the property side. Um, let me read my notes here. So Chubb has offered you a quote. The total of their quote is $131,106. And in that particular premium, they have included four things that we would have to buy separate policies <clears throat> for. So the main property, the equipment, the earthquake coverage, and then also, if we stayed with travelers, we would have had to get what's called a wind hail deductible buy down policy to help offset that 250,000. So Chubb has given us an offer that accomplishes all those things and no 250,000 wind hail deductible. So they're giving us 30 million earthquake, which is the same as what we have now. The wind hail deductible is 10,000, much better than 250, except for two locations. So Chubb has 25,000 wind hail deductible at the library and the airport. So those are our two locations where we would have a larger wind hail deductible than 10,000, but still it's not 250,000, much better. Um, had we had to put all the travelers offer together, it would all come out to about $196,000 and Chubb's offer at 131,000 <laughs> is much better. Um, so that helped to keep our property premiums flat and improve the coverage a little bit, in my opinion, because even our current property policy has a 25,000 wind hail deductible everywhere. So we're lowering that by going to Chubb. Excuse me, why did they pick the two spots for the 25,000? The airport was chosen because of the quantity of metal roofs, the underwriter said, and then the library was chosen because of square footage. I guess they thought that the square footage on that roof was something they needed to increase the deductible for. Okay, thank you. Yep. It's thinking the same thing, Mark, but I don't know why. I can see the airport. It makes sense in the airport, but, no doubt. But the library. The library is right next door to here. Like flat, is that a flat yeah, roof? Yeah, yes. it's a flat it's roof. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Nothing but. Well, wouldn't that be more of a problem? It's not that big either. But wouldn't that be more of a problem, a flat roof? No? No. Especially, look at what you have around it to protect it. Yeah. Well, makes right. sense. It's a good good point, good point. I can give that feedback to the underwriter as well and try to get you some more information because he's very familiar with all the, the buildings in Washington. He was your same underwriters when you had all the big claims. So they have a lot of data on all the buildings and I can ask more about that if you'd like to know why he's I mean, don't get me wrong. One. I mean, they're still cheaper than 25,000 everywhere. Absolutely. Or 250,000, but just kind of odd that they yeah. picked those two spots. I will get more info on that. Thanks. Um, so switching over to work comp for a minute, our, our experience, the city's experience kind of is like fluctuate a little bit. Um, you do an excellent job, in my opinion, in controlling claims as much as possible. You've got the safety initiatives, you've got policies and procedures in place for safe working environment, safe um, habits and rules. Um, they're documented well, which is also helpful. But with that said, you know, sometimes we have work comp claims that are kind of beyond our control. We can't really help it. That's why we have insurance. Um, the other factors that are built into the cost of your workers' compensation, um, if your payrolls go up, your premiums go up. The policy is rated on payroll as one factor. Your payrolls are up 9% for the next term. Um, the other factor, of course, is the experience mod. And your experience mod has worsened by 13% for the upcoming term. So if we add 13 plus 9, that's 22% exposure increase. <clears throat> 
Um, Missouri Employers Mutual, who is your carrier, offered a renewal at 22%, which matches your exposure. So that's a fair offer. Um, I think that it's uh, a good relationship with Missouri Employers Mutual. I always get good feedback from Shauna and the team about doing a good job with claims and taking care of people who are injured, um, being responsive. So the M Missouri Employers Mutual is always uh, proactive as well. And they come out and do unannounced surveys. They are watching people's working habits, watching to see if people are wearing seat belts, and they send a report back to Shauna with details. So that's a good thing that they do proactively. Um, so. So are you, are you saying that the uh, workman's comp claims went up 13% this past the year? The experience modifier is a way that the claims are quantified and it rates your claims on three of the, the oldest three of the previous four years. So during those three years, we had a lot of claim activity. And a 1% is even, you are average. If you're below one, you're better than average. Like the year in which we had a 0.88, we were considered 12% better than the average city our size. Um, and this year, since we're above one, we're considered a little bit, you know, below average in terms of our experience. But still, it's, it's very good. I mean, they, they go up near two, so you're not in that worrisome category. But it is causing fluctuations in your premium. For the last seven or eight years, your work comp premium has gone all the way from like 108,000 up to 180,000. So if you see swings from year to year based on your experience and also on your payrolls, you know, when you have more people, they're paid more, that's part of your calculation as well. <clears throat> uh, just wanted to briefly mention the auto liability. So auto, your claims experience has just been excellent. I'm gonna knock on wood. We have not had really significant big auto claims um, like we do see on some cities and some accounts, they can be very costly. We've had claims, but they've been minor, very minor claims. Um, the auto is, is one of your biggest exposures. And last year we had 111 units. We now have 122 units at the time of the renewal, so we're up by 11. So obviously when you have more autos, your premium goes up a little bit because you have more to insure. And then the other factor that we had um, for the auto renewal of this year is we have the higher valued units put on what's called stated value, which means if there is a total loss of, for example, a fire truck, you have already agreed with the carrier what you're going to get paid for it. And those high value vehicles, mostly all fire trucks were increased for renewal by quite a bit. So you're purchasing more insurance. You're purchasing the value of what you want for those trucks. A um, little bit of an increase on auto this year. Uh, let's see. The one, um, I wanted to briefly talk about the crime coverage, which is a minor component of your entire insurance program, but crime is also known as employee dishonesty coverage and it's a small policy. Travelers is now offering a longer term on this policy, so you can guarantee your rate for more than one year. So there's a couple of choices on the bottom of your premium page that we'll need to make a selection on. You can just choose to pay for one year at the price that's quoted, which is 2,433. Um, you can also choose to pay for three full years and get a discount the discount is $365, and that also means that your rates won't change over the next three years on crime. And then the final choice is um, you can agree with travelers that you're going to renew this policy for three years and just pay the same rate for three years, but not get a discount, meaning you can pay in installments over three years. So 
Um, just wanted to give you those choices and you can make your selection on what you want to do there on crime. And, and this is employees? Employee dishonesty. It, you know, sometimes we see claims where uh, an official will misuse funds. You know, something like an employee gets a hold of a credit card and doesn't use it um, according to the rules, um, okay. things like that. It can also kind of be known as like a fidelity bond for certain employees. Um, some of our positions are required already to be bonded. Uh, for example, I think the treasurer um, already has bond, but other employees that have access to, to funds, um, that is mainly what a crime policy is for. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. So closing, I don't want to keep you all evening, but I just wanted to um, thank you all, especially Sherry, for getting together all the renewal information because it's a lot of work. And she got it done in the time frame needed. Thank you very much. Um, also want to thank Shauna and Mary, who are a big part of that. I have two other um, compliments I wanted to pass along to the city, one of which is, you know, when we have an incident, the carriers require a lot of documentation, photos, reports, a lot of data to be gathered, and the city does an amazing job in putting that together. So when we get a report of a claim, it's very complete. And in recent experiences, that has helped us. When we have to go back to something that happened five years ago, and the carrier wants to know, do you have pictures of that? Or were there any witness statements? And often we do, and that helps our claims experience as well. Um, the other thing that I think you do really, really well is to follow the insurance requirements that you as a city have developed. So it was a while ago that um, Daniel and Henry helped to guide and, and make suggestions on what insurance you require others have and how to make sure they have it and how to make sure they add you as additional insured when they are doing work for you. That has also come up recently and benefited the city tremendously to have that documentation, to have done that work when before the work commenced. Um, so just wanted to pass along compliments. Uh, that's pretty much it. So I'm happy to answer questions and uh, we appreciate working with you all. You do a great job. Thanks, Amy. You're welcome. <clears throat> no questions? Okay. I just want to say I'm not an insurance guy, but I appreciate the explanations and no, when you read it, it kind of is gibberish, but it does make sense. So thank you for being here. You're very welcome. Um, and, the, and I guess for me, I, we need to decide on the crime before we approve this. Is that correct? Well, we have it within your letter to go ahead and, and enter into that three-year policy so that we get that savings. So I think all we need is a letter to move this on to council. Um, and uh, under reported department heads, we'll have approval at the council meeting. Okay. Yeah. We'll make yes. a motion moving on. Second it. Okay. Motion by Holmeyer, second by Hydrich. To move it on, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Motion passes. Thank you, Amy. Thank you all Thank very you. much. Thank you. <clears throat> ESCI Long Range Study. I told. Um, Tim, in the essence of time, that we had a lot of stuff on the agenda, or whatever. That this is, uh, but I, I'm being, I'm being nice. I haven't finished yet. I'm just saying, but uh, there's a lot of good information in this report. The mayor and I uh, got a briefing on this about three weeks ago uh, from the representative from ESCI uh, out at the fire training center. Uh, like I said, a lot of information in this. I just want you, there's no action item that we're asking for you to go ahead and do tonight. Tim wanted to go over um, the highlights, I guess, if you will, but I don't want, the conversation doesn't have to end here tonight. We can still continue this on next month because there's a lot of ideas that are, as you see, it's a long range plan. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Tim. Thank you, appreciate it. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. 
Uh, ESCI was actually contracted through the Community Fire Protection District, so I want to say first all thank you to the city to help supporting this effort, uh, the fire district uh, and the city working together for this plan. Uh, in this plan, what we're going to talk about first is where do we go? So the first thing that came out of it is we have a great culture, a great organization, don't screw this up. Uh, so that was the first thing that kind of came out of it unofficially. That won't be basically read if you read the whole report, that's not in there. But in the discussions with the consultants when they were here, they're, 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 you have a good thing going, don't screw it up. Uh, big thing is focusing on our firefighter safety. We're going to hit up each of these uh, a little bit later in each, each one of these. Uh, education, fire prevention, we know where we're at there. The one that was kind of a threw, threw a little monkey wrench at us was the outside legal review. We're going to get into that. Develop a strategic plan, we were quite aware of that. Uh, the review of the fire administration was, was a bit of a punch in the gut, to be honest with you. And uh, when we get there, I'll kind of explain why that was, that kind of set back a little bit. That one was a little bit chew, hard to chew on. And exactly to, to follow up on Amy's point, the capital replacement plan, our equipment is not getting any cheaper. Uh, you recently approved a truck for nearly a million dollars. Uh, we actually upped a lot of those gap insurance numbers. Uh, they were previously between five and six hundred thousand dollars. We're bringing them up to nine hundred thousand dollars, so that if there was a complete and total loss of a vehicle, we're not paying that out of the city's funds. We're, we're insuring for that. So, what does all this mean? Uh, if this is a ten-year plan. So, there's some short-term one one-year items. There's some intermediate three-year items, three to five-year, and long-term goals of all of this. And so that's what we're, we're kind of chewing on right now. Right, right now we're trying to figure out with the budget year coming up, what does the next year look like and, and how do we move forward with that. The big lesson learned is, is we try to reinvent the wheel sometimes. And so there are standards out there, there's best practices, there's, there's codes, there's things that we can follow and model after others that have already been put out there from the industry. So we don't need to go to try to figure this out. Um, so that's one of the things, we, we were having a discussion recently and I'm like, stop. What does the standard say? What, what is the best practices? And let's follow that approach rather than trying to reinvent the wheel. Um, and then the other thing is we need, a, we need better detailed and a documented plan. We, we, we've been kind of chasing our tails somewhat, so we need to get ourselves a little more organized. Fire safe, firefighter safety, obviously. I don't care what the fleet value is. The assets of our firefighters are first and foremost. Uh, one of the things that uh, the consultants actually did was rode on a call with us. They actually caught a fire. And so they were very impressed by the turnout, very impressed with the number of guys there, guys and gals there, the actual execution knockdown, they were very impressed with it. Afterwards, they started asking a lot of firefighter safety questions. What are you doing for decontamination of gear? What are you doing about carcinogens? What are you doing about diesel fuel exhaust in the stations? And, and the list went on and on and on. And so it's, it's been a um, kind of a deep dive into that and a review and, and looking very hard at what we need to do to make sure we're keeping our folks safe. Uh, it's the lowest labor cost you have in the entire city. So if you look at that total population of what you're getting out of the fire department, that's your cheapest labor period. Uh, we are looking at some things with uh, coordination with Dr. Mohart for medical screenings, uh, including a grail test, which is, is cancer screenings. We're looking at heart and, and cardiac screenings as well. Uh, and you're gonna see risk reduction. You're gonna see that a lot and hear that a lot because it's gonna become a recurring theme that we're gonna talk about. Fire prevention. Uh, we need a program. Uh, we dabble in it, to be frank. Uh, I do a lot of work in it, and, and frankly, it's, it's not the best use of my time. Uh, so we need to figure out what's the best, what's the best moving forward. Uh, we do do a little bit of it. We're, we're, like I said, it's in the infancy, but we got to get this thing moving. One of the big pieces was software, and, and thank you to the purchase a couple months ago. That software is getting moved. We're starting to build occupancies, and we're starting to build an entire program. And as we've talked about for a couple of years, um, you know, you just don't start hiring an inspector and send them out without having a plan. And so we're now starting to the point where if you don't have the background backbone of it built, you can't support the plan, you can't put somebody on the street. And so now that we, we, we knew this was an issue um, and it's something we're working towards, so we're, we're getting this one. This one has actually gotten probably more traction than most of the others. The other piece that came out of the study was kind of interesting was a public education program and community risk. Frankly speaking, Washington does not have a fire problem. The residential inspection program, I can actually show you, I was looking through yearbooks in the early 2000s, we were running 20 plus structure fires a year. Last year in the city, I think we ran one residential structure fire, last year. For a city our size, that's, that's unprecedented. It's, it's unheard of for the most part. That can directly been pointed back to that inspection program and the efficacy of that program and what it's doing. 
But we have other issues. We have a lot of automatic alarms. How do we fix that? That's a risk because if we start running lights and sirens down streets, we're disturbing traffic. We are creating a risk needlessly for false alarms. Vehicle accidents. We have a tremendous number of vehicle accidents. So the community risk in public education is, is all emergency services, police, fire, EMS. And so we got to figure out in our community what are our real risks to our citizens and how do we address minimizing those risks for those folks. Uh, so that's something that, that hopefully EMA will help, emergency management will help drive some of that as well and coordinate that. And, and we are a part of that, but it's going to be a partnership between all of the various emergency services, including communications. Legal review. This is the one that kind of threw me a little bit. I, they, they, we tried to explain to them how we are arranged and gave them the background and they said, how, what's the relationship and, and how are you legally bound to each other? And we could very easily explain the contract between the city and the district. That was very easily and very, very detailed, and it was there. The fire company or your manpower and to the city and the relationship there is really fuzzy. And so the recommendation came out of, of look at an external review. If you look at states like Virginia, Maryland, Ohio, there are departments out there that work very similar where there's a volunteer fire company or there's a separate company that's actually providing the manpower and the municipality is funding it. And so we need to do a, a deeper review of that and they're recommending outside legal counsel. No offense to Mark, Mark does a fantastic job, but he happens to be the attorney for the fire district, the city of Washington and the Washington Volunteer Fire Company. And so there might be just a slight amount of bias on, on the legal side of that uh, with one attorney doing all of that. So an external review was recommended. Strategic plan. Um, we knew this, uh, we would talk about this for a while. We have not executed on this because we were waiting for this plan. One of those pieces was a standard of cover and a standard of cover basically says, what is the community's risk? What, is, what are your capabilities? What do you know? What can you do? Uh, and what kind of expectations are there from the community? What does the elected officials expect? What do the citizens expect? And so, and then you start building that out and you start measuring against it and saying, okay, if you have a response time, we want people to be somebody to be at the door within five minutes. Are we achieving that goal over the course of a year? And looking at that year over year over year. And so uh, it's building metrics basically to see how you're doing long term and, and what kind of efficacy you're having as a department and are you reaching the goals that are one, national consensus standards and two, meet the expectations of the, the citizens locally because they are essentially our customers. Uh, so the standard of cover is typically a very large document as well. Um, to Darren's point, the report came in, it was 138 pages. A standard of cover can be anywhere from 100 to 200 pages, and that's reviewed on, a, on an annual to every two-year basis to, to look at what are our expectations and what's changing in our community. Administration, this is the one that was more of a punch in the gut. Uh, there, there is a disconnect and, and somewhat of how we operate. Uh, we need to find ways to work more efficiently and effectively. Uh, part-time part -time efforts get part-time results. Um, doesn't necessarily recommend a paid chief, a, the chief of the department, but, but possibly a paid administrator of some way, shape, or form to basically help run the day-to-day -day operations. Uh, we're still trying to put a number of hours of background administrative work to every hour we're on a fire scene. Um, we thought that number at one point in time was a one to 10. There was about 10 hours of administration work to one hour on scene time. We're finding we're nowhere close. We're, we're finding it's, it's probably a, a multitude of that, if not 10 times that. Um, one of the things that, that we were struggling with was documentation of all things. Uh, we have a pretty rigid documentation system, but we were struggling to provide documentation that was necessary in order to provide a, a very clear picture of how we operate. And so that's a challenge as well as a lot of our documentation is hard copy. Uh, so there's, there was a push or a recommendation in there to move more of this electronically. And again, the RMS system that was purchased recently will help offset that. Uh, also on our reporting, uh, not only for our, our in, internal operations, but on our documentation of calls, making sure that those reports are timely and accurate. Capital improvement plan, this is where the, the money meets the road. Uh, a fleet replacement plan right now, we, we have kind of a hodgepodge of what's going on. Uh, the planning group within our department was given the green light to start working on this immediately uh, and figure this out. We, we typically had a 20 year replacement plan long term. Um, we're evaluating that, what makes the most sense uh, and what is the biggest bang for the city uh, for, the, for the buck. 
Um, so that's a little bit of a struggle. Um, again, it goes back to timelines, cost, do we lease trucks, do we buy trucks, what do we do? Do we look at a secondary market? Uh, do you buy demonstrators? There, there's a variety of op opportunities there. What works the best and what makes the most sense? We need to continue to coordinate between the city and the district. Um, we work seamlessly right now and we need to continue to do that. Uh, the report had a pretty lengthy piece in it too about fire station locations uh, and timelines for that. We're on target, uh, to be honest with you. Um, the station in the southeast was, was identified again and, and they agreed and, and basically said that the re previous report that we did is accurate and we need to maintain that moving forward. Uh, but we need to start looking further out. Where's, it, where's, where's growth looking at? It works very timely with the comprehensive plan looking at that. Roadway interconnectivity, where growth is anticipated, where do we need to put additional fire stations to provide the adequate amount of coverage for the citizens and the businesses that are out there. Uh, so that portion is out there as well. Um, reports are pie in the sky, but there, there, there could be, if you took it and ran it all the way out, up to 10 fire stations for the 65 square miles we cover. So where are we now? So we're all still an all-volunteer source uh, force. We're significant taxpayer savings. Uh, we were guesstimating $5 million a year. The consultants thought that was a, a very, very low number. Uh, so we're, we'll have to do a little more digging in to figure out what our labor savings really provide to the city and to the fire protection district. Uh, we have a very capable, trained, uh, very willing to work force. Uh, these guys were out Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, guys and gals, uh, not, no offense to any of our female firefighters, uh, but they're willing to serve uh, their type A personalities. They wanna get out and they wanna help people. Uh, so we're, we're very uh, fortunate that way. They're very committed to training and we have very good training facilities as well as very good equipment to work on. Uh, we're focusing right now on our documentation, our background policies and procedures. It's all the, the backroom stuff that needs to get cleaned up and, and make us better than what we are right now. One of the things that the, the consultants uh, pointed out is, is that we have a great story. Uh, being an all-volunteer, probably if not the uh, one of the largest all-volunteer departments in the state, uh, definitely covering the biggest population of anywhere in the state. Um, if you go to our website or you go to look for us, we're kind of, a, we're silent out there. We have a great story to tell, but we're not doing a very good uh, job of doing it. Um, there's a lot of people within the city don't realize that the fire department is all volunteer. And so how do we address that? And so we're looking at marketing that better and, and working to uh, sell that much better, working through local businesses that are actually willing to help donate their time now to support more marketing. And we're still the ISO class 3, 3B. The 3B is in the non-water areas. Um, so that's, that's equivalent to an o, a formerly what an ISO 8 would be. Uh, so that's a pretty low rating, honestly. So the rule we do have a little, a little bit to work on out there. Um, I've been looking at the, the ISO ratings and what does it mean. Um, the big jump is between a four and five. When you get below a four, you get incremental savings, and it depends. I actually emailed Amy uh, last week to try to get a better idea of, of what does that cost. Could we buy an ISO 2? Absolutely. We could, we could spend a whole bunch of money and get an ISO class 2. What is it going to do for the taxpayers? I'm not sure it's worth it. I think incrementally as we make ourselves better, if we continue to gain the points and do the right things for the right reasons, I think incrementally we'll get to a 2. But I don't think it's, it's a worthwhile effort to, to go spend a bunch of, of capital to, to push that issue necessarily. But we definitely don't want to fall backwards. Um, so that's where we're at right now. Um, again, as Darren said, he wanted to keep this fairly short. I think I did Good it. job. You did it, buddy. <clears throat> I could do brevity. I told you that earlier. But are there any questions? If anyone would like to report, I have to give it to you in paper because I cannot email it. It's too big to email. Um, so it's, it's a fairly large document, but if anybody would like a copy, I'm more than happy to have one produced for you. Thanks, Tim. Thank Appreciate you, Tim. Thank you. Report of department heads, administration department, owner's representative agreement. Uh, within your packet, uh, we, you should have a cover letter from me. Uh, December 22, the staff went out, solicited a request for qualifications for uh, numerous projects uh, that were identified in the capital improvement sales tax. Uh, they include some renovations to City Hall, City Auditorium, Public Works, the old pool house, and a new fire station. So we went out with those sets of qualifications. We received two, one from Egan Design and Build, and also one from Avis and Young. 
Uh, the committee reviewed those qualifications uh, breaking up and decided to break up the construction projects into two, the new fire station and then have the remaining renovations possibly with a different contract. Uh, the committee also recommended considering Avis and Young for the owner's rep for the fire station and Egan Design for the remaining uh, renovations. You can see the committee members in the cover letter that consists of the mayor, Councilman Coulter, Councilman Patkey, Fire Chief Frockenberg, Wayne Dunker, Chad Owens, and myself. Uh, after additional considerations, the fire department determined the new fire station best be designed and built by the traditional design bid build approach, which is, which is what we've historically used. Um, then an owner's representative con contract would not necessarily be needed. However, the remaining projects would best be delivered by having an owner's rep to oversee those remaining projects, and that's uh, why you've got the proposed contract with Egan Design and Build. Will you, uh, will you kind of exp sure. explain the differences and why it was good on one but not the other? Well, the, um, for starters, I guess, we have, well, I, I, Tim can, can address maybe the fire station and how they feel most comfortable. I can say that based on all of these other projects, there's some of these we can lump together and get better bids because if you put more projects together, uh, hopefully we're going to go ahead and get more, uh, uh, a, uh, a better bidding process or a more competitive bidding process. And so this first phase of what we're looking to do is to go ahead and just put the city auditorium, the roof insulation, and then there's also some tuck pointing that needs to be done with that building. And so you had $900,000 identified in your capital improvement sales tax budget for that. And so that's, and this is, uh, and just so you know, the insulation on this is gonna be an exterior insulation, so you don't, uh, don't do anything to, to uh, not see the, um, the ceiling of, of the old auditorium out there, because it's unique. Uh, but that would be the first project, and then they would look at lumping some of these other projects together and putting them out in bid packages. Tim can address why they... So the, ori the original plan was to do a design build for everything. And, and that is a, that's a great opportunity, and there was a law passed in 2016, and so it's, it's a fantastic way to operate. It, it cuts a lot of cost out of it in the front and keeps your engineering costs down. Uh, after legal did the review, they raised the question and said, uh, there's a law that says unless that building seven million, anything non-civil had to be seven million dollars uh, in order to, to fit in the design build. And so once we reached that threshold, like we're nowhere close to it, nor do we want to be that close to it, we backed away from it. The owner's rep was still an option, but for 250 or $300,000, we did not feel that that was a worthwhile expense on top of a project when we're already hiring an architect engineering firm, that it would be part of their responsibilities to oversee the construction, construction management, and be basically the city's representative owner's rep at that point in time during the construction project. Plus, Tim has 90 volunteer inspectors. Yeah, 180 eyes otherwise. <laughs> so. Uh, so before you tonight is just the uh, owner's rep contract. Basically, um, Egan will go ahead, put the bid package together. Uh, they're not even, you're not even going to have to have a design firm hired for this because they're going to be able to go ahead and put that together. They've got an architect on staff and we'll just go directly out for bids for those, for that first phase. So that doesn't lock you in any more improvement or any of the other uh, stuff that needs to be done is similar stuff uh, or other projects i should say not similar city hall improvements it's insulation some building security uh, minor renovations to the second floor uh, other projects down the road include the renovation of the old pool building for the parks office the idea is to go ahead and get them out of city hall and out there where a complex is for our parks and renovate make use of that building Public Works office remodeled. That office has not been remodeled since the 90s when it was built. Uh, it's been a long time. Uh, and then you got the chair, chamber had requested the fairground uh, restroom and arena lighting. Uh, I will tell you that you, we, we hope, after talking with Egan, that the savings that you get on the insulation and the exterior improvements out there at the auditorium, you will not spend uh, nowhere near that amount and then those savings you're going to need probably for the restroom and the arena lighting because the arena lighting's more than what the amount is already uh, of 220 it's pushing more Wayne got an estimate of two 280 so you're not going to get all of that done for 220 so you're going to need those that savings on the others 
And then there's also some, some work that could be done out of the parks maintenance and shed building remodel, but that's probably one of the last projects we'll <coughs> take a look at. On the lighting, I guess Ameren doesn't have anything out there right now, huh? Uh, I don't think that there's any rebates that we can go ahead and get with that. We did get some good news with regards to the library HVAC. We got $11,000 check coming our way for that, though. So. And speaking of that, so, so we went through all this a few years back. So why isn't why isn't Vergie, um just going over this? We we'll just like instead of getting Egan, why wouldn't we just? You have to like what? Well. That's kind of like a, I, I guess, they had the opportunity if they wanted to go ahead and submit something with this, and they chose not to, at least with the owner's rep. Hmm. They could have. So, but like I said, they feel that we're going to be able to go again and get the insulated roof probably for closer to the three, 300,000, hopefully when those bids come in, and we'll take those savings and apply it to other areas where you're woefully underfunded. Motion, motion move, it. move it on, send it on. Motion by Holtmeyer to send Second. it on. Second by Wessels. Any more discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes. Engineering Department, Third Street Overlay and Improvements Project Resolution. <clears throat> So the, uh, the county has an opportunity to uh, apply for a grant, a uh, transportation grant uh, that we apply for every year. So we're proposing to apply for the Third Street Overlay and Improvement Project that we have coming up this year for $100,000. So. Are they going to do that this year? Uh, yeah, it's out for bid. Uh, bids are due June 22nd, so hopefully we'll start this fall and it'll go into next year. Are we narrowing that street any? Narrowing, no. Uh, a, a little bit in some areas, but only, I mean, a couple feet. So. Just asking. Yeah. That's not the yeah, main purpose of that project. Sounds good. Other questions mm -hmm. or discussion? Yeah, on, that, on the third street, we're talking about going east. Uh, 47 to Jefferson, right. yep. So we're doing the sidewalks and an overlay. Kind of into on Fair Street, this bid isn't going to include uh, retaining walls as needed? Or uh, some retaining walls, yeah, in some areas. This is merely to go ahead and apply for additional funds if we need them, because the county's got this program set up to where other cities, the road districts, can go ahead and apply for these supplemental funds. So this is a resolution basically to just so we can go ahead and get that additional funding. Just so it's in the bid when we... That's correct. So we have that pocket of money if we need it. Motion, motion to approve. Motion. Send on, sorry. I'll second it. Motion by Patkey, second by Briggs. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you, Motion's approved. <clears throat> Parks Department, Black Evader Purchase. <laughs> Wayne, I'm glad you included a picture of a Black Evader. <laughs> I figured that, that, was, figured that may help. <laughs> we all had fun with it today. I was pretty convinced that was a spelling error when I first looked at it. <clears throat> uh, uh, before I get into that, I just want to introduce uh, the Parks and Rec Department has a intern this summer. His name's Logan Williams. Um, he's from New Haven. He is just finished his freshman year. He's going into his sophomore year uh, at um, University of Missouri, and he's a uh, Parks and Rec um, sports tur tourism major there. So he's trying to figure out if he wants to do the parks and rec side of it or the sports tourism where you work with, you know, major league baseball teams and all that fun stuff, you know, where all the, <laughs> all the real money is. So, um, this is our second intern since I've been here. The first one we had, some of you guys may recall Morgan Regal from, uh, when we opened up the pool, she was around and helped a lot with the pool and the ribbon cutting and all that stuff. So, it's good that uh, we're getting some interns out this way. I think it's been far and few in between um, since, well, for a long time. So, it's good. Welcome. It's been everyone. a big help. So, very quick learner. Um, so, the black, black elevator purchase, um, we went out to bid. And so, this, as you saw in the packet, will um, eliminate a step or a couple steps from us from when we do any kind of sod or dirt work on athletic fields or fairgrounds or 
random city lots um, where we won't have to cut out the sod and then bring in dirt and refill it, where this thing will go through and till it up and grind it up and kind of get the rocks to the top and we can remove the rocks and eliminate a, a process for us. It is something we would use quite a bit because we do quite a bit of different work. It seems like we're always laying sod um, somewhere, whether it's pool, new pool, uh, athletic fields, things like that. And so we went out to bid, received three bids. Um, the lowest bid was $19,404.24 from Redexum North America. Um, I guess any questions? Okay, I'll take a motion then. I'll make a motion to send on to council. Second by Patkey, second by Coulter. All those in favor say aye. 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 So moved. <clears throat> Skate park features purchase? Uh, skate park features. Um, so this would be the final phase of the $150,000 skate park um, renovation that was included in the uh, capital improvement sales tax. And so we'd be purchasing seven um, low to the ground features that would be basically on the perimeter of what's there now, the big concrete ramps, uh, all steel type um, uh, features that would be spread out. Uh, myself and um, Chad Owens, we were, have been over there a lot over the last couple months since, we, since February when we started this project, uh, the concrete project. And we've talked to different age groups and all of them, I was even surprised by the teenagers too. We talked to like dad and son, we talked to teenagers, we talked to little kids and everyone kind of felt like the, the smaller kids needed play features, not necessarily to get them out of the way or off the concrete ramps, they just, and looking back on the history of this project when it was put in in 2012, I believe, there was some money cut out of the budget then, and so I found a um, um, drawing of the what was supposed to go in in 2012, and it had these features on the outside, this perimeter, these perimeter features, and they were cut to save money at some point. Um, and so it'd be good, you know, based on the people I've talked to over there, it'd be good to get these features added to this project. And I didn't know when we started this project, I thought we'd be lucky if we had $5,000 left, depending on how the concrete and fence and everything came in. And that might only get us like one or two tiny features. So this is, this is good. I was pleasantly surpri surprised. So is the total project then coming in at right around that 150? Yes, yep. So maybe a thousand or two under. Yeah. So. Motion we move it on. Okay. Motion okay. by Wessel. Second by Coulter. All those in favor say aye. 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 I guess regarding that project, I should give you an update. They are putting on the Hardy Board siding soffit. Uh, it'll be completed this week. So if you, I don't know if, if any of you have driven by there, it does change the look of the park. and. Because I was over there a while ago before this meeting, and it looks nice. So it's coming along well. And then park staff, we have a few minor things to do. We're going to paint the lines on the get lines painted on the basketball court and uh, stain the park sign and some finishing touches to do. But this is that's all in-house stuff. So okay. Workman UTX purchase. Uh, yes, yeah, so um, we would like to replace our 1999 Kawasaki UTV. Um, it's got 3,000 hours on it. Um, it's been a good, good piece of machinery. Um, <clears throat> but we'd like to purchase a, a UTX. It's a commercial grade, um, <clears throat> more of a work UTV. Uh, be four by four utility vil um, vehicle. Excuse me, and very high uh, payload. And <coughs> we have the snow snow plow package put on it. And so we use this <coughs> UTV for all kinds of activities, spraying weeds, uh, snow removal, uh, works well on sidewalks uh, during the fair. And then we pull our <coughs> um, um, top dresser behind it. And then like different special events, we use the haul equipment and things throughout the parks. Um, and so we did go out to out to bid and um, <coughs> the winning bid came in at $37,680.74 and that is under budget of what I budgeted in the 22-23 fiscal year of $39,000.
Wayne, what is that? Uh, what is the air conditioning option? How much is that on that bid? <coughs> uh, and is that something that we really need in there? I understand comfort. Everybody wants comfort, but or is that just something standard on it? Well, it looks like it's, it's heat and AC together. It's twenty four hundred dollars. Yeah, heat and AC. Seventeen oh seven. If you're going to use it in the winter, you'll need heat. Yeah, heat in the winter. Heat in the winter. I'm not talking about heat. I'm talking about air well, conditioning. Yeah, but it comes, comes together. If it comes together. Right. Yeah. Right. It does. When it's used during the fair, it helps. I mean. Yeah. <laughs> Nowhere to go to cool off now. Right. <laughs> One of a few places. Yeah. Other discussion, guys? No questions? It seemed overpriced when I first started looking at it, but then, like I said, I mean, I know what Mark's brought up. When you add four-wheel drive to it, uh, snow plow feature to it, um, and the and a, the payload, it's more than just a regular side-by-side. -side. Yeah, it's not not your recreational right. or what you would and in, you know take out in on today's the world. The normal side-by-side -side is over twenty thousand. So yeah, and with no problem. With not right. Yeah. So again, I was re reading this. I was sticker shock as myself, and then, but after looking into the more details, I guess I I do agree. What everything is getting so. That's a motion from me. Pass Just on. make her last for 10 years, Wayne. <laughs> motion it. by Packy, guys. <laughs> the other one lasts a long time. On it. Yeah. <laughs> I'll second it. Move it on. Second by Bear. All those in favor say aye. Uh, aye. 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 All right. Treat her gentle. Thanks, Wayne. Thank you. Street Department Caterpillar 953 track loader purchase. Does this have air conditioning? <laughs> Let's hope so. Good evening, Council. Uh, the first item we have on our list for a recommendation is to replace our uh, older 953 Caterpillar loader. Uh, the current one we have is going to be at about 16,000 hours, um, so it is ready to be set aside for a secondhand use. The new one is probably not tentatively going to be here until January of next year. So at that time, when that shows up, we'll move the other one out to our recycle center. And then when we get ready to grind our mulch pile, we'll have it out there. And instead of having to rent a piece of equipment, we'll have it for that. Then when the fair starts, we'll move it out to the fairground for their rental use. And then shortly after that, we'll probably get rid of it. Uh, it is worn out, so it's ready to go. Um, the Caterpillar was a good bid for us. We did go with the extended warranty. We went with a five-year, 10,000-hour warranty on it, and which seems like 10,000 hours, but we average about 2,000 hours a year on these pieces of equipment. They run 10 hours a day, uh, five days a week, and six hours on Saturday. So they are the bread and butter out there. Anytime we pull one piece of equipment out of there to move to the recycle center or move to the fairground, we're setting ourselves up for a hydraulic hose on a Saturday with 80 people showing up is a nightmare for us. So it's always good to have two out there. Uh, we are also going with that loader. We got what's called the waste handler package. It has a different bucket configuration. It has some clean out bars on the back of it. It has some uh, reinforced hydraulic hose where the hoses come out for the lift cylinders. And then it also has what they call a clean out, a clean out system, which is on there also. And what that basically does is it moves your track away from the frame about 10 inches. It gives you more room to clean. You can imagine the stuff would get bound up in there, so. Which is very beneficial. Yeah, yeah, so that's our plan and it's our recommendation that you guys are good with that. Um, we did budget 390000 and unfortunately this came in over budget, but since it's not going to be here till next year, when budget time comes, we'll reapply that money, we'll budget up to the proper amount, and be ready for January. Make a move, motion moving on. Motion by Holtmeyer. I just, I just want to say, I, I, I kind of quizzed Tony last night or this morning on this here and thought, it, you know, looking into it, but thanks for the explanation, Tony. I know the landfill package adds to it, yeah. and the, uh, the extended warranty adds to it, even though it's not broke down in the bid. So um, thanks for that. I'll second. Unfortunately, that equipment just takes a beating out there. I mean, with, with, whether it's the dust or the mud or pipes going through it, it's, so it, it's hard on equipment out there. Thank you. Second by Pat Key. Any further discussion? Okay, let's vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes. <clears throat> Got a new monster vehicle. Establishing yard waste dumping fee schedule. This is uh, 
going to council to est actually establish a new ordinance. We've never had our pricing for dumping at our recycle center for our contract has never been in an ordinance before. For what did Pam say, 31 years or yeah, something? Yeah, it's just been a policy. So the prices have never gone up. So we think it's time we get up to speed with our competitors in the, in the area and price ourselves the same way. We did put together a committee. Thank you, uh, Mark Wessel and, and Mike for sitting on that with us. We looked at the prices, we compared it to some of our local competitors, St. Louis Composting and the St. Peter's facility. Um, we try to make our prices comparable with theirs. Keep in mind, this is not charging our residents to dump. The residents still dump for free. This is mainly just for our tree contractors or our guys that are clearing properties and things like that. How do you tell the difference? Most of them come in with a bucket truck or they've got, you know, landscape company things on the side of them. I'm not going to deny there are probably some that try to sneak in that we don't know. You know, they have a white pickup truck. They fill out the sheet and say they're 309 West 3rd Street property. And then, you know, we don't have time to go chasing all of them around. I'm not going to say we haven't. Yeah. We have, but we just don't have time to do it every day. But most of them are pretty well known to us. And, we, you know, we get anywhere from two to five to six of them a day, so. I know we've talked about that in the past, Joe, about a sticker program or something again, or this yeah. or that, but anybody can use somebody else's truck. Or... Yeah. I mean, well, most, most of the contractors are pretty good because our prices have been so reasonable. Yeah. They're more than happy. So what we will probably do is if this gets approved, we will probably send a letter out to all of our contractors. Uh, finance has a whole listing of the regular billing for that send them a notice we are going to increase our prices first of july and give it a roll we we spent about forty four thousand dollars last year grinding that mulch pile so we need to help ourselves out well if we missed a couple pickups it's not it's one thing but we're not going to miss roll off dumpsters chip trucks and tandem axle dump trucks so we don't get a lot of them uh, you know kj will come in with his truck one smaller roscoe will come in with a little bit most times we don't see a lot of those we were when we were going through this i believe it came up that the revenue last year was like a little over seven thousand dollars was the only revenue made so we're still not going to be this isn't going to be a profit uh operation but it, it hopefully will get it up a little bit closer. helps sure. every little bit helps sure okay make a motion send it on second motion by holtmeyer second by coulter to send it on uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes. Real quick, Council, while I'm here, I would need to give you a heads up on a truck that we purchased in December 2021. We ordered a Freightliner dump truck with a salt spreader and a snowplow on it. By April of 2022, there was a surcharge that we had to, the price had gone up on the vehicle. It was about a $6,700 surcharge. Uh, we did a budget amendment and moved it forward. The truck was finally built last summer uh, then it went to the um, the aftermarket guys they put the bed on it they put the salt spreader on it and the snow plow by the time we got the truck in May there was a second surcharge of another $900 on top of it it's probably we just can't keep up with the prices coming out of the factory and that's all it is um, so that truck ended up being 173,535 total uh, Mary had bu bumped our budget up to 172,940 so we were a little bit under, but we do have some money left over from some other purchases in our overall equipment budget. So Sweet. the truck did show up. And you got to understand, when you, when you order it in December, they don't build it till July. And then by the time that it's built, you know, the people that are putting the salt spreaders and the plows, they're not going to pre-order stuff because they never know what's going to get <clears throat> kicked out of your purchase. You know, if they buy all that stuff and the state bid or source well kicks the truck out, because we've seen that. So... It take, took a little longer to get it, but the truck is in and ready to go. So we got charged twice, you're saying, Tony, after the original surcharge. There was, a, yeah, we never, we didn't pay anything, but yeah, the surcharge went up once, and then by the time the truck came to us, there was a second surcharge. So how can they throw that in after you sign a contract? Because the contract is based off the manufacturer's price from the factory. So whatever, you're basically buying it at factory price. But if the factory keeps increasing their price... Because of the state contract? Well, it's a source well contract, actually. It's, Same it's the cheapest it gets. I mean, it's, you know, there's a, the sales guy we work with, they, there's no money for him.
but the factory prices just comes down to it. The factory can will increase their prices needed. Unfortunately, we saw the same. I think was it with our some of our other pickup trucks had surcharges on them. So the good news is we can go out and plow some snow right away. We got it in May. Amen. <laughs> that's wow. Like, that's asinine. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. Anyway, so I just wanted to give you a heads up on that. Okay. Thanks for all your work. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Thank you. <clears throat> Water Department, Water Service Pipe Code Amendment. Good evening, Council. What you have before you is an ordinance change for our service lines from the uh, main to the curb stop and then from the curb stop to the resident's home. Um, about four or five years ago, we uh, made the ordinance that the developers and the builders could use PVC or high density poly from the main to the curb stop and then from the curb stop to the home to try and save money. Um, one of the requirements was to have a, a, a tracer wire with that. What we found is that the tracer wire is not being brought up to grade from the curb, from the main to the curb stop and then from the curb stop to the home. Uh, what that causes is a problem for us to locate that service in between the main and the curb stop. The main, that, that line is the city's responsibility. If we miss that and it's hit, it's the city's responsibility to repair that. If it's in a concrete road and we're repairing it, we're looking at somewhere around a three, four thousand dollar repair. So we need to get back the reins of being able to locate from the curb stop to the main. Um, I did a little cost analysis today. At today's dollar amount for copper, the longest run possibly that a contractor or a developer would have to run would be a 50-foot run. It would be about $351 for them to add to that. The cost difference for us to repair it, for them to add to that, it doesn't seem right for the residents to have to pay that if it would be hit. So that's why we're changing that back to copper to that. Questions? That sounds good. Take a motion. I'll make it. Motion by Hope Meyer, second by Coulter. All those in favor say aye. 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 EA passes. It gets recommended to. Recommended to council. That's right. Send to council. Backflow prevention code amendment. Yes, what this one is, is uh, the water department is required by the Department of Natural Resources to keep an accurate record of backflow preventers in the city of Washington. That's anything from irrigation to production to whatever backflow preventer. Um, we've been having an ongoing problem of getting accurate records of people sending us in the reports. Um, we've, we could always sending letters out trying to get people to do that. Um, what we've decided to do, and we've been working on this for a while, was we needed to add some teeth to our existing code. Our existing code just said, you need to give us a report. That was it. There's nothing to back it up to say, if you didn't, this would happen. So what this does is in the red adds to uh, the ability for us to be able to follow up if we're not getting that. Not saying we're gonna have to, but it gives us something to use if we have to. So that's what this code changes for. And it's still a requirement for a licensed the requirement for a licensed backflow preventer. Um, they have to be certified by the state. That's the state's requirement to make sure they're certified. If they don't show a certification number, then we can then turn around and report them to the state if we have to, that they're not licensed. But we haven't come across that. It's just getting the reports and getting them in there because we're going to have a sanitary survey in 24, which the department will come out and actually go through all of our records. If they start looking at our records and see that we don't have anything to enforce the fact that we're not getting reports, then we'll be in trouble and, and possibly be fined for not having the enforcement that we need. So that this will give us. So, Kevin, the one I, as I was looking at those, it, you know, I thought it made sense, but the one that struck me was lawn sprinkling. So a lawn sprinkler, if somebody's got that in their yard? Well, that's irrigation systems is really what that was that refers to. So that's an underground buried sprinkling system. Not if you put your garden hose out and if you run a sprinkler. No, no, no. Okay, I understand that. I understand that. But if someone puts that into their yard, builds it into their yard, underground, they have to have that backflow and they have to inspect yes, it and they have to do yes. all that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yep. They come right back into your water, all the chemicals. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't know that. They, call it a, they call it a cross connection. If something would happen and it's all hypothetical scenarios, but it has happened in other places, that's why we have these rules and regulations. It can cause a big problem for a community if that would happen. So that's why. 
Further questions? I'll take a motion. I'll make Move it on. Motion by Holtmeyer. Second. Second by Bear. Second by Bear. All those in favor say aye. <clears throat> aye. aye. Motion passes to send to council. Permits and charges for water taps and connections code amendment. Okay, this one here is just to kind of clear up some things that have been going on for a long time. The way the process was, so when somebody came in to connect to the water sewer and have a tap, they'd come to the engineering, they'd get the permit, then they'd have to pay a water connection fee, a sewer connection fee, then they'd have to go out to public works and pay a tap fee and everything else. And it, got, it was re always really confusing. So what we decided to do was just lump all those bills into one place. So now what will happen is the, the developer or the builder will come in here, get their permit. As soon as they get their permit, we'll be notified. They'll come out to public works. They'll pay for the connection fees, uh, the tap fees, the meter, the materials all at one time. So they're doing basically we're trying to get as close to a one stop shop as we could for that. So that's what this is. So permit through engineering payment through public works. public works. Yes. Kevin, do we need to go back and look at the, the fees as well? Because it's been probably seven years or better since and before that it was a very long time. One step at a time. <laughs> we got a lot to look at. Your question, yes. <laughs> yes, we got a lot to look at. So. I don't know if any of you remember. It was, it was, it's, it's been a long time. Bad, it was it's been a long time that we've looked at a lot of them. We were so. way behind. Yes. So. Okay. Take a motion. Make a motion to send them. Motion Thank by you. Pat. Get a second it, or to send it on. Second by Hope Meyer. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passed. This is send it to council. Thank you. I do have, I just, I know for the essence of time so we can get the regular council meeting started, there's just one other report. I'd like Jennifer to go ahead and give you an update. Good evening, council. Um, I'll make it quick. I just wanted to share the announcement I received last week from Washington Ambulance and they gave their notice to Franklin County to move their services back to Washington. So we don't have a date yet um, when it'll be official. They have to talk to the commission about their contract, but they are going to be coming back. Good work. Great news. Thank Congratulate you, Jennifer yeah. for, for hard work and getting that done. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank, <clears throat> thank you. That's all I have. Okay. Take a motion. Motion to, to adjourn. Motion second. Patkey, second by Hydrates. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I have one thing I've got to say. There's there's another meeting yet. It's another meeting. Yes, there's a regular council meeting. Yeah, there's another meeting.
stay at a resort down there. To tell you the truth, I'd rather go somewhere else, but they all want to go there. They all want to go there. Yeah, we've been there the past couple of years. There you go. Going with the group? Yeah, just, I'd rather go up Maine. I want to hit Maine. Oh, well, I love, we love You're Maine. Ready, we've been ready when you are. I want to go up there. Or Yellowstone. Yeah. Check that out. Go ahead. Go ahead. Regular meeting of Washington, Missouri, City Council, Monday, June 5th, 2023, 7.15 p.m. Bear? Here. Briggs? Here. Coulter? Here. Heidrich? Here. Holtmeyer? Here. Patkey? Here. Reed? Wessels? Here. Please rise for the pledge of the Here. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Will all the council members answer if they have or have not read the minutes of the council meeting dated May 15, 2023? Bear? Yes. Briggs? Yes. Coulter? Yes. Heidrich? Aye. Holtmeyer? Aye. Packey? Yes. Wessels? Aye. Motion to approve. Second. Motion by Packey, second by Holtmeyer to approve the minutes. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Motion's passed. Approval and adjustment of agenda, including consent agenda. You have the fireworks display, liquor license approval for Wartman Fortner LLC doing business as Jack Flash and liquor license renewals. Any discussion? Make a motion. Second. Motion by Heitrich, second by Patkey to approve the uh, consent. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion is passed. Priority items, mayor's presentations, appointments, and reappointments. Industrial Development Authority reappointment. In order, you guys, I hereby submit for your approval the following for reappointment to the Industrial Development Authority. Wally Hellebush, term ending May 2029. We need an individual vote on each one, I guess? Yes. Yes. Okay. Move we approve. Motion by... Uh, second. Wessels, second by Hydrich. All those in favor say aye. 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 Next one. I hereby submit for your approval the following for appointment to the Library Board of Trustees, Jamie Holtmeyer, term ending 2026. I'll make a motion. I'll second. Second. Motion by Padke, second by Holtmeyer, or uh, Coulter, I'm sorry. I guess you couldn't do that, could you? I can't do that. <laughs> All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Next one. I hereby submit for your approval the following reappointment to the library board. Leanne Gisburn, term ending June 2026. I'll make a motion. Motion by Briggs. Second. Second by Patke. All those in favor say aye. 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 And now we're going to do a double. I hereby submit for your approval the following reappointments to the Park and Rec Commission, Tessie Steffens and Gavin Woolley, both terms ending 26, 2026 at June. I'll make that motion. Second. Motion by Patkey, second by, I'm Bear. sorry, motion by Bear, second by Patkey. All those in favor say aye. 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 And that motion passes. Thank you, guys. <clears throat> Thank you, Gavin. Public hearings, proposed code amendments, short-term lodging. Okay. All right. Sal? Yep. Go ahead. Start. So um, I'm going to do the presentation from down here so I can run the computer. Um, but as uh, I'm sure you all are aware, um, when the moratorium was passed about four months ago at this point on all new short-term lodging in residential areas, um, part of that requirement was for the Planning and Zoning Commission to send a recommendation to Council um, after their May meeting. So that means they were able to review it for three months straight. And that is what, I, and that is what they did. They had um, three different um, uh, discussion items, one public hearing on the um, proposed changes. And uh, tonight I'm here to present to you uh, with their recommendation of the um, short-term lodging code amendment. And again, tonight, this is just the public hearing. There is not an ordinance um, on there. Uh, but as you can see in my letter, um, there were two kind of scenarios that they really went back and forth, 
back and forth with uh, and reviewed at their um, three meetings. Um, the first of which, which was to create a tourism lodging overlay district um, that would span multiple zoning districts and designate an area where short-term lodging uh, was permitted. And there was a lot of discussion on um, how far reaching that would be in the, the, in the areas of that. Um, and then the other discussion was to uh, only allow new short-term rentals uh, in the R2 overlay district and R3. Uh, given that that approximately covers much of what is considered walkable in the downtown currently. Uh, so that R2 overlay was created years ago um, for a reason that it was downtown adjacent neighborhoods that often have single and two family uses. And so there was a lot of discussion that that overlay district, um, why reinvent the wheel if that boundary has kind of already been set of what is considered almost downtown adjacent and walkable to downtown. Um, and so at their last, uh, at their May meeting, they did make a recommendation uh, of the following, and it would be to um, make an amendment to the code to allow short-term rentals uh, defined as any rental of transient guests staying for less than 30 days and is not owner-occupied. That was an important designation that we didn't have before, where if it was a more traditional bed and breakfast where the owner actually lived in-house, that would remain as a special use permit across all residential districts. If it was more short-term rental, where the owner is not um, occupying the home at the same time, it would have to fall under this new definition. Uh, the second would be short-term rentals would continue to be permitted by right, meaning they don't need a special use permit in C1, C2, C2 overlay, and C3. So that essentially is commercial districts where they're already permitted today. And our C2 overlay is this darker blue. That was created again years ago as an overlay district of um, kind of our Fifth Street corridor that allows for single, um, two-family, as well as commercial uses. So most often business downstairs, residential up top, um, kind of that mixed use. And then our C3, which is our, down is our actual downtown designation zoning. Um, and so basically what you would be able to see is a lot of this blue in this corridor as well as our downtown district would continue to be able by right, meaning that uh, you don't need a special use permit and you don't have to be a certain distance from one another. Um, so new short-term rentals would be required to have a special use permit in the R2 overlay and R3 multifamily district. So again, just the same process we have today, but now short-term rentals would only be permitted in this pink. This is the R2 overlay district that was created, I believe in 2012, Darren, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, it was about the time when we recognized that, that, that um, single family and two family could both be permitted uses. Yeah, and that area on both, it, it, it straddles both sides of downtown and goes south of downtown, um, is you know, often seen as downtown adjacent and walkable to downtown. And so that was kind of the boundary of utilizing that existing overlay district um, for new short-term rentals to be able to apply for special use permits. Um, and then on top of that, any new short-term rental shall not be within 150 feet of any existing short-term rental. Uh, and that is what this map is showing you uh, today. Charles and our engineering department put this together for us on GIS, and it shows what boundaries today would actually disqualify the parcels that could not apply for a short-term rental permit. Um, the reason we chose 150, they went back, we went back and forth between a couple different um, 150, 300, even we looked at a map that was at 500 just to look at what different uh, boundaries would look like. And uh, 150 we thought was the most appropriate. And I think the best example actually is right here. Um, there are two short-term rentals uh, caddy corner from each other on High Street. And the discussion was um, with this 150 foot buffer that would remove the homes pretty much directly adjacent to it on Rand, but then would still open up homes on Rand to be able to apply for it on the other side of the street. Once you got more than 150 feet, all of these homes on Rand, the property owners would not be permitted to apply for a special use permit um, if they wanted to. And we thought it was um, unnecessary for someone on Rand Street to not be able to apply for that use because someone all the way on the other side of High Street that they may or may not even know that is in operation is over there. And so this 150 feet, you know, our blocks downtown are not all the same. You can see here there are different shapes depending on where they're at. But 150 feet is 
pretty generally a half of a block. And this gave a good example of, of that. This house actually is dead center on the block, and you can see it pretty much says that is the one that it's going to be printed, permitted on that block. And so if you can imagine that in the future, if you were to put one further down on High Street, that would kind of take up on that block. So the question would be is if, if that, like for example, the where you have it on High Street, those two that are there, Sal, if one of those discontinues, how, would, how do we reassess that or how do we know that? Yes, so that was discussed as well. Um, you have to remit your uh, tourism tax quarterly um, and we'd have to write that into the ordinance, but it was discussed possibly if you don't pay for um, two quarters. So if you're not hosting for six months out of the year, you will become inactive, um, allowing this buffer to go away. And so then you then other properties could go ahead and apply. Correct. <coughs> yep. um, and again, these would be grandfathered in. So as you'll see some of these buffers already overlapping. That does not affect anything existing. That is just um, uh, the new requirement for anyone wanting to apply. Um, and then the last um, uh, recommendation was that short-term rentals would not be permitted in any other residential district. So that being essentially downtown and this corridor on Fifth Street and commercial districts still permitted. Everything you see in pink here would be a special use permit as well as this light blue because this Market Street's all zone multifamily. Um, that could still apply for a special use. Um, but any, yeah, with the buffer. And then anything else would not even be permitted to request a special use permit. It's just not a permitted use. Uh, and so obviously anything in yellow here would no longer, we have some outliers here um, that were approved previously um, that would no longer be able to do that. Um, there are some gaps here, essentially uh, Elm and Cedar specifically, um, for whatever reason, were always stayed single family. That's probably because historically they were single family. That never got brought into the R2 Overly District. And so you would have a gap here um, in the middle. That's in between the two that would not be permitted. Um, and so that was a lot of the, the discussion, but that is just how that recommendation um, played out. Um, and there was one other thing that was requested of staff to be able to, because um, we talked at one point about uh, having a percentage of rent, uh, percentage of total housing units in the city um, that could not be more than, you know, you take a percentage of your total units and that's your maximum amount of short-term rentals that you allow in your city. Uh, and then build 100 homes in a year, then that cap gets raised up. Well, when we're talking about creating an area that this is the only space that you can do it, um, we thought the buffer was a better idea and the, uh, the buffer is gonna kind of cap itself out anyway as people um, continue to request it. There was a question about a, a general range of what that cap may be. Um, Charles and I tried to play with the mapping system to figure out a, a, an idea of how many more we could fit. It's very hard because that buffer depends, so you can see these buffers are based on property shape. And so if you have one larger property that chooses to do so, the buffer is gonna be bigger. Um, and so, you know, a very large range, if you just put 150 foot buffers in here, shoulder to shoulder and fit them in here, you could probably fit about 50 more. But again, that's probably an unscientific way of saying that's the absolute maximum that if right. 150 here, do another one, do another one, more realistically, you're gonna have buffers that start overlapping and you're gonna have gaps that just don't fit. So I would say realistically, you could probably do another 30 um, that without having any problem. Um, but essentially that is the recommendation from planning and zoning um, with those five that I put in the letter, um, again with a 150 foot buffer and um, to reiterate that we didn't have before, if it is owner occupied, then it can still be in any other residential zone district. Um, a good example of that is south of 100, we have one here off of Studerman. Um, this is an owner-occupied one that was approved for a special use permit. They had a basement that they wanted to have as a more traditional Airbnb. That was permitted there. That would still be able to be permitted today in an R1A if they were owner-occupied. So they're grandfathered if they're owner occupied, is that correct? Correct. That oh, well, there, everything existing is grandfathered. Right. Um, okay. That's the only way you can get grandfathered if you're existing. If you're owner occupied, it's just still a special use permit, but you can do it outside of the 
R2 overlay district. I mean, you could do it, you know, we have a couple over on the uh, east side of town, as you can see these buffers, um, you know, here on, on 8th Street. Um, this, I do not believe, is owner-occupied. That's grandfathered in. If they wanted to come in, I have to say this is approved, if they wanted to come in and request that same thing, it would have to be owner-occupied in order for them to be able to get a special use permit. So if it's not owner-occupied, you have to be. There aren't any in R1. You're prohibited. You're prohibited. R1 prohibited. And R1B. So you would ascend any residential district that's not R2 overlay. So that is essentially saying we are putting um, short-term lodging in this pink area on the zoning map, and that is essentially our downtown district is what this recommendation would say. Now, two things, I want, or the last thing actually I want to say before I open up to questions for me um, is that we have from the get-go said to planning and zoning as well as we're seeing this as a step one, as a possible um, temporary change. Um, our comprehensive plan is still in motion um, with our consultant. Um, the issue of short-term lodging, short-term rentals and how to deal with those have come up at every public forum we've had, every business roundtable, um, the steering committees. So our consultant knows that that is something that they maybe want to write into their recommendations. Um, and I just wanted to throw out that we could have a recommendation from our consultant this fall that they could come up with a better solution. And so we did let P&Z know that, hey, this is, what, this is what they are recommending to lift the moratorium and get this back open in these districts. And then when the comprehensive plan comes forward um, by the end of the year, we just have to do it by the end of 2023, um, that we could be looking at this again. Our zoning code is always a living document. So. And, and Sal, did, did, did P&Z look at the, the criteria, the 10 criteria for special use permit? I mean, we looked at it, obviously it was pulled up. Uh, we, it was difficult, it was decided not to write new criteria just for this one use. Because a special use permit is, those 10 criteria are for all special uses. Correct. Um, you know, whether it's a, a gas station in C2 or short-term lodging in, in R2. So, um, you know, I think if you're going to write new criteria, have a new application, that's where you go back to that first option where you say, hey, here's your district, here are the rules. This is completely separate from a special use permit, but um, I think the recommendation was to stray away from that for now and just utilize our existing code in the R2 overlay. And later on your agenda is the ability to revoke a special use permit, um, not related necessarily to short-term lodging, but right now we have no ability to revoke a special use permit. We just tick it and Sometimes the judge, you know, it takes a while for that process to go through. And so now council would have the ability under certain circumstances to revoke special use permits of any kind if they are not following the rules set forth in their ordinance. Mark, if I could ask the question with regards to if you have uh, an existing short term rental and you're in an R2 overlay district, and assuming that the council would 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 follow along on the recommendation the Planning and Zoning Commission has uh, recommended, are those buffers that are there for those homes, are they there forever? Or if those also become uh, no longer used as short-term rentals, do those buffers go away? If they're, if they're no longer used... Put your mic over there, too. Sorry. Sorry. If they're no longer used, then those buffers would go away okay. because the special use permit would disappear. Just making sure. Right. And that's that's going to be possible if they don't pay for two quarters and their special use permit? So, yeah, we are creating a master list of what is considered active and paying um, uh, just to get everything in order as we've gotten a lot of these in the past few years. But, yeah, we can... Uh, pretty easily say, okay, it's been two quarters without this person remitting any tourism tax, meaning they have not rented it out at all. It is now considered inactive. Um, it can just go back to long-term rental. It's also a way of policing our short-term rental fees. I mean, are your bed tax fees? Yes. If you're not going to pay, you're not going to get allowed to continue. That's a right. good yep. approach. And that doesn't, they could, it's very possible We've had short-term uh, rental owners decide to go back and forth between, hey, I'm going to do long-term rental for one year 
and then go back to short-term rental. They could still do that, but in, within that one-year period, if a neighbor comes and asks for it, then they could lose that. That's just the risk of turning off your short-term rental at that, at that time. Okay. So. so the way I'm reading it, and I think Mr. Patkey asked too, I just want to make sure even downtown C1, C2, down Fifth Street, the overlay, still 150 feet apart for anything new? No, not inside the commercial districts. Okay. Because it is, we, have, we did look at adding a buffer in the C2, C3 district as well downtown because um, there was concern of taking away too many apartments that could be considered market rate, you know, um, uh, workforce housing. Um, the issue with that is that a lot of the buildings downtown, you have multiple units. And so say you have six units in a building and you're deciding to do one of them as short-term lodging, well, that would take out the entire block. And so it was determined, let's not do a buffer downtown. Uh, if it becomes a problem where we are having no long-term rental downtown and only short-term rental, I think it's something that we can address. But at this point, um, as you can see, you know, there are quite a few dots downtown, but it's right. not the majority of our parcels. And a lot of these that are on here have <coughs> multiple units and have decided to just offer maybe one or two of their units. Um, a good example is, um, or the old Drogi's building, John G's, that's three right. stories. They have six units um, on the second floor that are all long-term, two units on the third floor that are short-term. And we don't think that them or the neighbors should be penalized because they're mixing it, which is the whole point of downtown, it's mixed use. That's, yeah, yeah. and that's why I'm asking because just reading your bullet points here, the way I read it, it says any new short-term, but you're saying any new special use for a short term then would be 150 feet apart uh, yes i'm sorry i should okay. clarify that any special use in the that is required is 150 feet correct thank you no other questions okay we need a motion to accept no, it in the minutes public hearing. we're going to open public it up hearing. for public okay. hearing great this is where you want to tell them about okay folks we're going to open it up to the public uh, ground rules tonight, as uh, you can tell, there's lots of folks here. Let's uh, limit our comments, please, to three minutes and speak your piece in those three minutes because there's not going to be an opportunity to ret return to the microphone after you state your piece. When you step to the mic, please say your name and your residence, please. So without uh, further ado, do I have a comment? on STRs. Nobody? Hearing none. Oh, oh yeah. um, I'm Diane Marsing Hammond, owner and manager of Missouri House Vacation Rentals. Uh, good evening, council and mayor. Um, my residence, 680 Scenic View Drive, Union, Missouri. Um, I am a sixth generation uh, resident, well not resident, sixth generation of Franklin County. So deep roots, uh, everybody graduated from high school here. I know you guys always, always like to hear that. Uh, and half my family have businesses in Washington as well. Um, and several of my family also live in Washington. So coming from residents as well as business folks. Um, I know a lot of folks look at short-term rentals as taking away housing affordability. So I do wanna say that um, it is found from Oxford, ex at Oxford Economic Study that SDRs are not a significant driver of rising rents and housing prices. Um, this is information I had sent you all in February and happy to send this all to you again. Um, including majority of short-term rentals are purchased off market or have been sitting on the market for weeks <coughs> or even up to a year and then completely rehabbed um, or major renovations done to them. So a lot of work going into making these homes and beautifying the community. Um, claims that short-term rentals are unsafe and dangerous to neighbors and poorly maintained and degrade the neighborhood character. Uh, facts, short-term rentals are bound by the exact same safety codes as long-term rentals and owner-occupied residences. And we are incentivized to keep the properties beautifully maintained for our guests so they meet and often exceed Washington community standards of property care and appeal. Uh, claims short-term rentals don't contribute to local economy and don't support jobs, um, which also is untrue. Uh, found by Rent Responsibly, Air DNA, and Vacation Rental Managers Association that 74% of operators employ at least 
one staff member or contractor. We rely on services of the local folks as well. And we distribute tourism dollars to local businesses outside the commercial hotel areas. Money spent by guests are kept here. Um, as far as the area, um, personally and business-wise, I would love to see it larger because we have folks coming in for wedding venues on the outskirts of town. They're not staying in downtown Washington. They want to be closer out to the other areas. Folks coming into Prina Event Center from all over the world, they want to stay close to Prina. And downtown Washington is not where they want to be either. Um, and um, I really think it's a residential use, whether it's three nights or three years that someone's staying. These are amazing folks coming in to visit family and relatives, dog shows, and the tourism. Any questions? Okay, thank you. Thanks, Diane. Good evening. My name is Mike McFatridge. I live at 1514 First Parkway here in Washington. I didn't graduate from Washington High School or St. Francis Borgia, but I am from Missouri. Um, as many of you know, I have been uh, engaged in this conversation for quite some time. I'm not particularly enamored with this solution, but I support this solution. I think this is a compromise. The information that was provided at the uh, PNZ meeting with regard to occupancy, which was derived, derived from a commercial website, which I think is probably overstated. Uh, I was, when I initially spoke, I was speaking in terms of wanting to use the data that's developed from tax receipts. Um, but regardless, uh, you currently have an occupancy at or below 40%. So, I don't necessarily think that they're opening the whole of Washington to STRs is necessary. And I certainly don't think that if I owned a short-term rental, having this solution provides me some stability with regard to my, my investment, knowing that there aren't, isn't going to be a blanket opening of STRs throughout the community. And as I've said before, if, in fact, the uh, notion of supply and demand holds, the more STRs you have, the opportunity to lower the value derived in terms of revenue, both for the uh, short-term rental owner as well as the city in terms of tax receipts, is a real possibility as you increase supply. Or, you know, as you, as you increase the supply, obviously there's going to be a f more fight for demand. So, I think that this is a reasonable solution, and as Mr. Manucci had said, that the, this is something that can be revisited. So, I support the uh, I support the uh, uh, the notion of in, uh, of engaging in this approach to the ordinance. Thank you, Mike. Anyone else? Okay. Good evening, my name is Kim Obermark. My address is 1418 East 5th Street in Washington and I am a realtor with Berkshire Hathaway. Some of the concerns that I have with the proposed short-term rental regulation in the city of Washington, the use of residential homes as a short-term rental would be limited to a very small area with special zoning and buffers applied currently to the operating short-term rentals. There are no buffers nor zoning restrictions for long-term rentals. The city of Washington has only 35 operating short-term rentals in the city limits. With over 6,000 housing units, the short-term rentals are barely 0.6% of the housing and much needed lodging for options for visitors. The proposed the proposed buffer is 150 feet around any short-term rental in the special R2 overlay near the downtown area. A property must submit for a special use permit within the zoning and a special use permit may be declined. I understand and support reasonable regulations for short-term rentals. However, the proposed regulation is severely restricting the property rights of homeowners in the city of Washington, Missouri, and effectively 
placing unreasonable low cap on the number of short-term rentals. The property rights of both sellers and buyers are a concern for me. I had a buyer come in. He ended up buying the property next to um, Hawthorne Inn because I could not put him in a position where he would be going to planning and zoning and everything <coughs> else would happen. He was a cash buyer. The negative effect on my career and income and the legal ramifications for the realtors, which there are plenty in this meeting tonight, um, the current information that would affect the use of the property. I have a very strong concern with the 150 feet. Um, if I'm writing a contract for somebody and I don't know every single thing that's involved, where they're, what they're playing, what they're gonna do, and have to go out and figure out if it's 150 feet or not, really affects my career and um, the way that most of us do business. In this market right now, you write a contract because the properties are gonna be gone in a minute. So for us to make sure that it's 150 feet and figure out if there is another property that is um, used for short-term rental, I, I just don't even know how that we would be able to gather that information. So those are some of the concerns that myself and many realtors in Franklin County have talked about and have taken to the board, hoping that they will come up with the decision that we can move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Sal, is there something that we could put on our website <clears throat> stating were, and I believe we have more than 35, don't we? That we know of. There are 35 currently active that are paying the lodging. Right, that we know of. Yes. So could we somehow put that on a website so somebody in that situation could just boop and Actually, so pop if, up a map? And if this were to pass as recommended, um, we would publish this site and update it as needed. Mm -hmm. So just like our zoning map is open to all citizens and realtors, they could pull this up and see what the buffers are. Mark, they, we would need to use it for our internal. Yeah, they could also, and the, we get these occasionally. Sal probably has a better handle on it than I do, but sometimes we'll get a request from a realtor or a purchaser asking for a zoning letter, mm -hmm. and they'll want a zoning letter from Sal that says, here's what the property is zoned and here's what it can be used for. It would be very simple to do the same thing with regard to short term rentals. That's correct. <clears throat> but for the sake of ease, yeah, we would publish this map and keep it updated so people can see the buffers. Yeah. Anyone else wish to address? Hi, my name is Cindy Johanning. I live at 134 Ladera Lane in Washington. I've been a realtor here in town for 23 years with Coldwell Banker Premier. I'm opposed to short-term rentals being limited to only a small portion of town of the R2 overlay. There are many other reasons people come to stay in Washington other than to visit downtown or to go to the fair. There are other wedding venues. There's Perina Farms, the wineries, the hospital and lots of other reasons people may want to stay in Washington but don't necessarily need or want to be in the downtown area. I think if short-term rentals were allowed throughout town with a special use permit, of course, I think that just makes a little more sense in that they would be more spread out and they wouldn't all be in such a concentrated area. That's it, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. My name is Bonnie Martin, and I live at number four Riverview Court in here in Washington. Um, we can see from the map today of where these are, they are primarily downtown. That's where they are today. Um, and there are a few elsewhere, and they'll be grandfathered in. With the new ordinance, which I support, um, nobody that is operating a business today will 
be forced to stop operating their business. If they're got one now, they can continue to have it, even if they're not within or you know closer than 150 feet. But what this does is give peace to the people who live in the residential neighborhoods. That's where we all bought our homes. I looked at the, the zoning map published by the city when we purchased our home, and that was a deciding factor in where we lived because we didn't want to live where there was business. And this overlay and this proposed ordinance, this new ordinance, would protect the residents who live here. And there is still, I think it's a wonderful compromise. There is still a huge area and still lots and lots of properties that can be turned into more short-term rental if the city needs them or if people want to open them up here. Like we, we've heard that there's only occupied like you know, less than 40% of the time. So I don't know that we need more than we have now, but the opportunity for them is there, and it's there in that zone. <clears throat> and, you know, Washington is not, I, I didn't grow up here either, so I grew up in a much bigger place. Washington is small. You can get from one end of town to the other in a few minutes. You can get anywhere in this town with a car any, you know, in less than 15 minutes. So nowhere is too far to go to Purina Farms or to weddings or whatever. Um, but, you know, they're, they're not, a lot of these sit vacant of 60 or more percent of the time as it is. So to open it up beyond where they already are, that's where they are. That's where they're open right now. Um, it, it doesn't make sense because the residents, they have rights as well, and that's where they bought their homes, in a residential neighborhood, to be amongst neighbors, not somebody else's customers. And that's, all I guess, all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. I, I just want to uh, touch on and kind of clarify a little bit the, the occupancy that keeps getting brought up. We did talk about that at um, the previous two Planning Zoning Commission meetings. They requested a little bit more information about um, maybe how often these were used. Uh, as Mr. McFatrich brought up, we looked at utilizing our tax data to determine um, how often these are leased out. Um, it actually just derived from, okay, this person paid um, X amount this quarter, here's what their nightly rent is, and could figure out how many nights they stayed, but we quickly realized that was not a, a statistically valuable option because the nightly rentals fluctuate so often. Uh, barbecue and Blues Fest can have one nightly rate, and then in February it is significantly cheaper, and so we couldn't necessarily figure out exactly a good occupancy of how often these are rented uh, via our uh, tourism tax. Uh, we did find, um, we, we had, uh, uh, Ms. Marcinique sent us a, a link um, to that third party website um, for listing uh, basically all Airbnb data, and that's where we were able to find that it hovered around or averaged the last year is about 43% of the year um, occupied. Um, that just means that properties that were listed on Airbnb were blocked out, meaning they could not be rented. They were, they were full 43%. Uh, and then our average occupancy over the next 30 days, which I put in the letter as well, uh, was about 40%. So that's where those numbers came from that we sent you. That, was, that link in your letter was from a third party that we thought was our, our best chance of getting some type of occupancy data. Um, and it was, it, it, full disclosure, it was brought up at Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, there were some members that thought that was not uh, relevant data into um, making a decision because we don't regulate uses based on how um, often they are used. I think the example was if a, if a bar is doing you know, well or not, we're not going to say the bar, if someone wants to do a bar next door, you, you can't open this business because the business next to you isn't doing well. Um, and so that was also a discussion where the, the occupancy didn't necessarily come into um, the recommendations as much, which is why I, I added it to the letter, but it didn't really affect the recommendations from Planning and Zoning Commission.
Good evening, everyone. My name is Nat Hammond. I'm uh, a resident at 680 Scenic View Drive. I'm also an owner and operator of Missouri House with my wife. So I uh, also wanted to ask, um, when you got that data, that was just Airbnb? I, yes. Yeah. Okay. So it doesn't take into account VRBO and direct yeah, bookings. You, it's probably a, almost reverse of that. So probably a lot more than 40%. So um, I also wanted to kind of jot some stuff down. In uh, 2018, the city of Washington spent $12,000 on a study to determine if more lodging was needed. The study concluded that more than 100 hotel rooms need to be added to meet the demand within, and that was five years ago. According to the article in the uh, Missourian in May 2022, only 11 hotel rooms have been added. SDRs are a major contributor to the tourism tax fund and is exclusively used to promote tourism in, the, in Washington. SDRs have been meeting, in, meeting the growing demand of visitors in the area. SDRs also meet the increased change of how we, a person travels and lives. All homeowners that use their uh, property for any length of time, rental within a reasonable you know, guardrails, uh, they don't, they don't uh, strip the property rights of the, of the responsible hosts. So um, I guess one thing to consider is you know, we need some more lodging. And it's, uh, the other thing I want to also kind of emphasize is people working in this industry, the lodging professionals that are, that are doing this, those aren't, aren't the only people that are employed. We employ people that do landscaping. We employ people that do the maintenance on these houses and, and rehab these houses. This employs a lot of people in this area. And without these people coming to visit, these local shops, they don't get frequented. Most people here locally, they're not going to go to these shops as much as people coming from out of town. Everybody else, I'm going to catch all you guys at Walmart or Schnucks at some point. So that's one thing to consider. A lot of people are, the tourists are coming around downtown and, you know, rather than Schnucks and Walmart. So please consider that. Thanks. Thank you. My name is Denise Dickinson. I have a short-term rental outside of your proposed boundaries. I've had it for several years. It's 508 Burnside. And I would like to say that putting these boundaries keeps from Washington having free trade. If somebody comes into town and wants to purchase a property, they should have the ability to purchase that property wherever they want. The city has securities in place to protect neighbors. Before you can get a special use permit, a letter is sent out to all neighbors. If a neighbor has a problem, they speak up. If neighbors don't have a problem, then you get your special use permit. I could say for a fact that my Airbnb is kept up better than long-term rental properties on my street. I contribute more to the beautification of the town than some actual homeowners do. I have guests who are traveling nurses who come to my property that's not in your proposed boundaries because they don't want to be downtown. They don't want the hustle and bustle of a downtown area. They want to be in a quiet neighborhood close to the hospital where after a long shift they can come home and have quiet. So bottom line, I disagree very strongly with there being boundaries for any future Airbnbs. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Delisa Curran. I live at Two Riverview Court here in Washington. Um, and I appreciate this um, consideration. I think that this is a good compromise, like those who've spoken before. Um, we do have, I just looked up the real estate listings. I've heard some tonight about how um, houses have, have been purchased for Airbnbs that have been sitting on the market for a long time. Um, we had two in our neighborhood that were purchased before anybody else had a chance to buy them. Uh, looking at the market for home purchases, there's only six available in the price range of um, under 250000 which severely limits uh, housing for other people. Uh, as far as nurses and traveling people staying in houses, like Bonnie said, it's not far. 
and the downtown area is fine. They don't want to do that. There's other places. I agree we need a, a hotel. <laughs> we do need more rooms. Um, if there's a way to get that done, I strongly recommend it. Um, also, as far as employment, um, residents also employ people. Um, one of my neighbors hires someone to do her yard. She hires someone to come in and clean every week, not just 40% of the time. Um, so anyway, we uh, appreciate what you're doing and uh, we'd ask for your vote. Thank you. Thanks, Delisa. Anyone else? Good evening, Council. Uh, my name is Emily Hopkins. I live at 42, 421 Watermill Drive in Washington, Missouri. I am the tourism director for the city of Missouri. And I just kind of wanted to point out a couple different things. Um, I understand both sides of this argument. I think that having regulations in place, very firm regulations, so that there isn't wishy-washy voting going on is very important. Um, I think that where I get hung up is not realizing how important tourism is to the city of Washington and the fact, as many people have said behind me, there are a lot of use for, there's a lot of use for having STRs outside of just the already proposed zoning. And I think that using the, um, I, I forget what the yellow, yellow district is. R1 and B. Okay, so where Cedar and Elm, as we discussed, um, having that block right there, to me, shows straightforward right there why we need to consider a tourism overlay. Um, I think that there is just some oversight going on as to exactly the uses for where the short-term rentals should be and could be, um, and I think it's very important to consider that. Um, I am obviously immersed in tourism, um, I'm the tourism director. I see where this money is going. Um, I see also the tourism dollars that are coming to me to be able to market Washington. Um, those dollars are significantly increasing year over year. Um, in 2022, over 2021, we had more than a $50,000 increase in our tourism bed tax. And if anyone would like any of those numbers, I'm happy to provide them. Um, but that was without a significant increase in short-term rentals, or short-term lodging establishments coming into town that weren't already previously existing. Um, and in my opinion, that's going to cap out eventually, which therefore means we are not going to have the rooms available for people when they come to town. Um, the the uh, lodging study that happened in 2018 got mentioned, and we do, we, we are in need of more rooms. And like I said, with the increase in lodging tax that is happening consistently, year over year, even in a post-pandemic world, um, we, we are in need of those rooms. Excuse me, in need of those rooms. And so whether that is a hotel or short-term rentals, I think that that's something that we really need to keep in mind. And limiting those to just our downtown district, I think is, is very much an oversight, in my opinion. I am in favor of regulations. I am in favor of having very strict rules. Um, but I do think that not considering the tourism overlay um, and just where exactly those boundaries would fall is a little bit of an oversight, in my opinion. Thanks, Emily. Thank you. Anyone else? Hi. Hi. Chelsea Allen, 210 MacArthur. Um, I actually just have a question for clarification. You brought up earlier that there was a um, change in the law that was going to be processed, I believe, with this request to change it from having to go before a judge to being able to have the city council members revoke a special use permit, correct? That is the next item on the agenda. Okay. Correct, yes. Yeah. So the uh, proposal is to allow council to be able to revoke a special use permit. And when I say go before a judge, right now we can just do a zoning violation as sure. a ticket. And, and you have to wait revoke. for the judge to respond. Yep. So... And in, in my understanding of this, if you take that consideration in before you take this consideration and allow you gentlemen to start making decisions based on um, usages after they've been permitted, then you're not punishing someone for what you think could happen and you're allowing people to show you how the business will thrive. And then if there is an issue, 
you all have the decision-making abilities to revoke that. Um, and to me, that makes more sense than putting this very strict map in order to not be able to um, offer other things. And I think also when we were talking about, you know, the usage of Purina, and I don't have that information, but the amount of income that happens from those shows at Purina, I know people that work there, it's insane the amount of money that goes into that facility. And when you do restrict people to only being able to go downtown, they can't stay downtown with their dogs. So if you're using a special use permit that's in more of a residential area, they're gonna wanna stay somewhere where they have a yard and they have the ability to let their dogs out, let them run, run you know, whatever. And obviously these are very well-trained dogs and very high-end things. But I think you have to take into consideration that as well when you're looking at different areas than just say you can go downtown with concrete if you have kids or dogs, so. Thank you. No one else? Okay. Discussion? I would just like to say thank you to the Planning and Zoning Commission. I know it was a few months worth of meetings and uh, public hearings, et cetera. I was part of some of those uh, in the mayor's absence, but um, a lot of intelligent conversations went into making it happen. We looked at a cumbersome map that had 150 and 300 and 500 foot, and it covered everything. So. Um, Again, I think it's a great compromise. I do understand Emily's point where we have that one circle. It's like we, we don't want to have that in, in, uh, in our zoning where we have bubble zones out there. But in this case, we leave that go. Um, that is something there, but something we can look at again, I think, in the future. Um, but again, I, I just want to say thank you to Planning Zoning Commission for their hard work and putting it forward. And uh, I think it, it definitely makes sense. So thank you. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that, and I'd also, you know, thanks everybody for your input tonight because it's important to hear all the different sides of, of everything as we sit here and think about it. So, um, yes, I think good points all, and it is, as Sal said, you know, it's a, it's a living thing that can be changed, and if this is our starting point, then so be it. If it's not and we still tweak it, we can still do that now, but I think it's always going to be changing depending on what that occupancy is and where we're at going into the future. We talked a little bit about tonight, some of you did too, about having a new hotel and we're very aware that the city needs one. Mm -hmm. Okay. In motion and moving on to I'll motion. make a motion to accept in the minutes if second. we're done. Okay, motion by Bear, second by Holtmeyer to accept it into the minutes. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Motion passes. Proposed code amendments, a special use permit revocation. This, again, and as stated, this is an amendment to the special use permit section of the code that allows council under certain circumstances to be able to review an existing special use permit and be able to vote on revocation of that special use permit. Um, just as a special use permit sounds like in its name, you are able to conditionalize that um, with uh, certain parameters that a business or that, that user property owner has to abide by. And if they are not abiding by that, currently we just have to send them a zoning violation, give them so many days to respond, and then ticket, um, which is a way to handle that, but sometimes that can take some time. And in this case, if it becomes problematic, if we have um, repeated calls from a neighbor that they're not following um, the conditions of their special use permit, we can open up another hearing at city council to be able to revoke it. And again, this goes across the board for all special uses in planning zoning. Um, actually, two months ago, decided that this was something to move forward with and was, was a good code change regardless of what happened with short-term lodging. I would add, it's not just revocation, it's also you could do a suspension in, in, instead of a revocation. So you don't automatically go to revocation. I think it's a great Explain idea. That. Oh, sorry, Joe. I think it's a great idea for, uh, to have this available not only for short ten lounging, for any other permits we had allowed that uh, we can come back and uh, if we have problems, <coughs> then we could uh, revoke them. That's a great great amendment, Ed. So elaborate just a bit, Mark, yeah. suspension 
or revocation of the special use permit is what we've got written in here. Correct. So we can regulate whether it's suspended for days, months, or right. that's a decision of us as a council also? Correct. So it's not just a they don't pay or they don't follow, yep. we revocate, we can. Right. I think a, a good example would be um, if say there was screening that was required, they needed to put up fencing or landscaping and if it were to be torn down, um, we've had that happen before on special use permits and we've had to send them notices saying you have so many days to put it back up and if they don't comply, we'd have to send a, a ticket and then that has to go before a judge. And in this case, we could say, hey, you are, um, you know, suspended out of, you're out of point. compliance and we'll sure. bring it before council and they could suspend it until it gets brought in back into conformance. Okay. Mark, a question I have with regards to the, how this is written up and just so the council is aware of this. So items, you've got item number three and item number, let's, let's item number five, for example. Failure of the permittee to pay any tax, fee, fine, or other governmental charge required by law. Yes. If you apply for a special use permit, I get one, let's just say, to operate a, a gas station. Mm -hmm. I've got other properties within the city. As this council knows, every year you get a list of people that are behind on their taxes. If I don't want somebody, if I was a, somebody that was opposed to a special use permit for a gas station, I'm just using that again as an example, can I go ahead and file this to go through this procedure because that individual didn't pay taxes on another piece of property that has nothing to do with the special use permit? No. Okay. No. All right, that's just clarification. Only on that piece of property. It, it, yeah, it would only be on that property and it's not instituted by the public. It's instituted here. Okay. Did, does that need clarification or could that need, I, I guess because when I read this, I'm looking at violation of anything. And then if you look at number three, it also says violation of any ordinance of the city regulating the permittee. Yeah, but if you look at C1, it okay. says the city council decides whether to refer the matter to planning and zoning for record recommendation. And then if it's re referred to pl planning and zoning, you go through the same project process for a hearing as you would with the city council. And then ultimately it comes back to the council for a decision. So it can't be used as no. you know, a vendetta for somebody that no. didn't get the vote that they wanted to to say, hey, they're not paying their taxes over here it only applies okay. to that part. just making and I, you all understand yeah i would think that could point. be clarified though you know that that number five could actually say you know if tax fees fines related to that property yeah the property i, I my concern is just because sal or anybody here at city hall could start to get inundated with people that are like i said they don't they don't they didn't like the fact that somebody got a special use permit and they want to go ahead and and like i said just do anything within their power to go ahead and stop or revoke it or suspend it. We can clarify it if you want. I think it's already covered because it talks about the failure of the permittee okay. to pay the tax. And if they're getting the permit for that parcel, okay. that's the parcel that it applies to. Okay. The special use permit is for that parcel only. That's right. You've got the permit for that parcel. You're the permittee for that parcel. And if they're negligent to pay on that parcel, right. their special use permit can be revoked for that parcel. Correct, or suspended. Yeah. Or suspended, sorry, yeah. Well, no. or, if they, or if they had, uh, for example, if it was a, I don't know if we still have this in our code, but if it was a liquor store and they didn't get their state license at yeah, that location. Um, you probably see it, although not often, we probably see it with uh, sales tax. Right. When they don't pay their sales tax and then the state comes in and says padlock them. Yep. Because they didn't pay their sales tax, and then if they got a special use permit, you could suspend it or revoke it. Okay. But just so you guys know, if they're permitted, that doesn't that doesn't apply. This is just for special use permit cases. That was a great point because we all know that there are some people that have five, six, other, even more properties that are not way behind. Correct. Any further discussion before we vote to send this in? You need to open it up to the public. It's oh, public you're right. Hand. Thank you for reminding me. Again. No problem. Sorry about that. Anybody wants to talk about okay. it? Okay. If anyone would like to talk about uh, this proposed code amendment uh, for the revocation of special use permits, please come forward.
Okay. Hearing none, I make a motion to approve. Accepted to the minutes. Accepted to the minutes, I'm sorry. Okay. Second. Motion by Patkey, second by Wessels. Wessels to accept into the minutes. All those in favor say aye. 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 It's accepted into the minutes. Thank you, guys. <clears throat> An ordinance reappealing section 400.235 of the Code of the City of Washington, Missouri, and an acting lieu thereof a new section 400.235. Holtmar. Introduced, Introduced by Holtmar. Discussion. discussion. No further discussion. Go ahead, Sherry. An ordinance repealing section 400.235 of the Code of the City of Washington, Missouri and an acting in lieu thereof, a new section 400.235. Holtmeyer? Aye. Briggs? Yes. Wessels? Aye. Patkey? Yes. Coulter? Yes. Bayer? Yes. Hydrich? Aye. And by your vote, the motion passes. Ordinance. Ordinance, pardon me. Citizens' comments? Citizens' comments. Any citizen? Any citizens? I'm Julie Howell, and I lived at 604 Hancock Street till you tore my house down. I would like to know now what do you want me to do? Because I'm not leaving town, and I would like my property back, but I can't even say I would like my house back because it's gone with all of my belongings inside, along with my daughters. Now what? Explain to your kids that their house is gone. 25 years I was in that house. How dare any of you do this to me? I didn't deserve it. So now what? You've made me homeless. Now what do you want me to do? Because obviously you guys have a plan, right? Because I don't. Everything I owned was in that damn house. I walked around the corner there and turned the roof off. Do you have any idea how that feels? I talked to that man before the night, night before. He never even mentioned that they were going to tear it down. Nobody did. All these homes in town that are condemned and everything else, and they're boarded up or not boarded up, and they're just still standing there five, six, seven years later. My house gets torn down immediately. Now what? Because nobody's got to have an answer. Because I don't. I was here 25 years. You never heard a peep out of me until I started letting the homeless people on my property and my neighbor went crazy. And then, I, and then, and then COVID hit. You guys ought to be ashamed of yourselves for what you did to me and my family. Every one of you. <laughs> so now what, sir? What are you going to tell me now what to do? Because I'm not leaving town. <laughs> I'm never going to be out of your side. Because this is my town just like it is yours. I'm a resident here. I was. My money spends just like yours does. You may have more, but I still spend mine here. I raised my kids here, all four of them, in that house. And Chief of Police Menifee sucked them right out, sucked the whole thing out of my life. Tom Neldon right beside him. So you tell me what to do next. Because I'm walking around because the cops towed both my cars for no reason. <laughs> This was all for no reason. So somebody better tell me what I'm supposed to do now because I don't like being homeless at all. And I see now all about the homeless people. Because now I am one. That's what you made me. Report of department. Anyone else? Okay, Sherry. 
report of department heads, renewal of city's property, casualty insurance, and payment authorization. As you were explained to by our representative from Daniel and Henry at the workshop, uh, we need to go ahead and approve uh, the new insurance for the for the next year it takes effect July 1st um, and she as she went over to the report unless you have any additional questions from the workshop uh, recommend that you uh, go ahead and approve such so that we can go ahead and start the paperwork start the renewal I'll make that motion second motion by Hydrich second by Pat key for the discussion all those in favor say aye aye, aye. Motion passes. Ordinances and resolutions and ordinance authorizing and directing the city of Washington, Missouri to enter into an owner's representative agreement with Egan Building Group LLC <clears throat> for construction improvements, including the city auditorium roof insulation. Patkey. Introduced by Patkey. As we stated at the workshop, this is a uh, first phase for improvements that the city had identified under the capital improvement sales tax. Uh, this first phase includes the improvements out at the city auditorium, which includes roof insulation, uh, exterior insulation, and also exterior improvements, which probably be tuck pointing as well out there uh, for that structure. So uh, the rest of the projects will have to be, we'll bring another contract before you, not only for uh, whatever construction it may be, but also a contract for them uh, to further be our owner's rep. Any further discussion, you guys? Okay, go ahead, Sherry. An ordinance authorizing and directing the city of Washington, Missouri to enter into owner's representative agreement with Egan Building Group, LLC, for construction improvements, including the city auditorium roof insulation. Holtmeyer? Aye. Briggs? Yes. Wessels? Aye. Patkey? Yes. Coulter? Yes. Bayer? Yes. Heidrich? Aye. By your vote, the ordinance is passed. 7B, please. In ordinance accepting the quote from Rodexum North America Inc. for the purchase of a black evader. Bear. Introduced by Bear. <clears throat> Wayne's here if you have any questions, but this is the bid that he received on this piece of equipment that he discussed at the workshop. No questions? Wessels gets to use it first, since he didn't know what it was. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see it once it comes. Right. <laughs> I, I move. <laughs> <laughs> I think we got an intro. Do we have an introduction? Doctor? Yes, we did already. All right, yeah, thank we you. Do. Go ahead, Sherry. In ordinance accepting the quote from Redexum, North America Inc., for the purchase of a black evader. Holtmeyer? Aye. Briggs? Yes. Wessels? Aye. Patkey? Yes. Coulter? Yes. Bayer? Yes. Hydrich? Aye. By your vote, uh, Ordinance 7B passes. 7C, please. Then ordinance accepting the quote from American Ramp Company for the purchase of skate park features at Optimus Park. Bear. Introduced by Bear. As we said at the workshop or whatever, this concludes the improvements that were identified in the capital improvement sales tax for the skate park. And uh, Wayne and his uh, department have gone out, gotten um, quote for the seven new skate park features and like I said we'd like to move forward and close yeah, that out they did I forgot to add earlier that they thought 90 days for installation but could be sooner since they're out of Joplin and we're close to them so great cool that's installed right mm -hmm. no further discussion go ahead Sherry an ordinance accepting the quote from American Ramp Company for the purchase of skate park features at Optimus Park. Holtmeyer? Aye. Briggs? Yes. Wessels? Aye. Patkey? Yes. Coulter? Yes. Bear? Yes. Hydrich? Aye. By your vote, Ordinance 7C passes. D, please. An ordinance accepting the quote from MTI Distributing for the purchase of a Workman UTX. Patkey. Introduced by Patkey. And this is replacing our 1999 Kawasaki UTV. It's came in under budget. Okay. Are we keeping that Kawasaki? Yeah, we're, I think it'll be a good vehicle for peak kit, uh, summer staff, seasonals and part-time that we have to get around because we found out this year, I uh, worked with Shauna uh, in HR and that's an avenue if, 
if we can get those kids. Uh, I don't have any this year. I thought I had one lined up, and it didn't come through. But uh, if we can get those kids to work, that would be an avenue for them to get around um, the park system. Okay. That's a good idea. Thank you. Further? Other ones. <laughs> Go ahead, Sherry. An ordinance accepting the quote from MTI Mike. Distributing for the purchase of a Workman UTX. Holtmeyer? Aye. Briggs? Yes. Wessels? Aye. Patkey? Yes. Coulter? Yes. Bayer? Yes. Hydridge? Aye. By your vote, Ordinance 7D passes. E, Thank please. An ordinance authorizing and directing the City of Washington, Missouri to enter into a sales contract with Fabic CAC for the purchase of a Caterpillar 953 track loader with extended protection plan. Holtmar. Introduced by Holtmar. Good evening, Council. This is the track loader to replace our 2015 one at our landfill for our operations there. We spoke about it in the workshop. Do you guys have any other questions about it? When, that, when the old one finally goes, you were talking about moving it around until finally it's, it'll be its time and you'll get rid of it. How do you get rid of something? Do you, is, is there a market for that? Or? There is. We use a, a website called Purple Wave. Okay. They sell all, all of our equipment for us. Okay. I mean, we could always use it as a trade-in if we had some other equipment, but we seem to do better when we sell it outright. Okay. That'll go pretty quick. No? Sounds bad. Okay, Sherry. An ordinance authorizing and directing the City of Washington, Missouri to enter into a sales contract with Fabic Cat for the purchase of a Caterpillar 953 track loader with extended protection plan. Holtmeyer? Aye. Briggs? Yes. Wessels? Aye. Patkey? Yes. Coulter? Yep. Bayer? Yes. Hydrich? Aye. By your vote, Ordinance 7 E passes. F, please. An ordinance enacting sections 221.010 of the Code of the City of Washington, Missouri. Holtmar. Introduced by Holtmar. As Tony uh, explained at the uh, workshop prior to the meeting, uh, we have uh, not included these fees in the past by ordinance. Uh, we just had a policy, but uh, as, as Tony explained, we are um, severely behind with regards to it. I think it's been 30 years, I think. Is that right, Tony? Uh, the last time it's been, even been looked at. So it did go through our solid waste committee for review. Uh, to go ahead and include that. And so you can see also with these uh, items, it's a lot easier for our staff to go ahead and identify the vehicles as they come into the yard, what to go ahead and charge them. And this is not for residents, this is? Correct. Let's, yeah, thank you very much for, our, for that clarification. This is ex strictly for commercial landscapers and tree, tree companies, et cetera, and for those that are clearing off commercial pieces of property. Go ahead, Sherry. An ordinance enacting sections 221.010 of the Code of the City of Washington, Missouri. Holtmeyer? Aye. Briggs? Yes. Wessels? Aye. Patkey? Yes. Coulter? Yep. Bayer? Yep. Hydridge? Aye. By your motion, Ordinance 7F passes. G, please. An ordinance amending section 700.020 of the Code of the City of Washington, Missouri. Hydridge. Introduced by Hydridge. As Kevin explained at the workshop, uh, this is going to go ahead and change for the section of pipe that goes from the main to the curb stop to uh, make that copper only, just so that our crews can go ahead and re readily go ahead and do our locates. Yes. So if a resident puts plastic, they got to put a trace bar? Yes, the, uh, the, the remaining code stays the same from the curb stop to the, to the, to the home or to the water meter, yes, that still has to have tracer wire with it. Um, what the contractors have been doing on that side of it is they've been running the tracer wire up the foundation. Curve box. You know, actually up the foundation at the, at the home for the homeowners. So that's, that part's been working out good. It's just been failing on our end of it, so. The portion that we have to, we're responsible. And, and that's our responsibility, yeah, right. so, yes. Okay. Okay, go ahead, Sherry. An ordinance amending section 700.020 of the Code of the City of Washington, Missouri. Holtmeyer? Aye. Briggs? Yes. Wessels? Aye. Patkey? Yes. Coulter? Yes. Bayer? Yes. Hydrate? Aye. By your vote, Ordinance 7G passes. H, please. 
In ordinance amending section 700.140 of the Code of the City of Washington, Missouri, and adding thereto two new sections, 700.141 and 700.142. Hydrich. Introduced by Hydrich. <coughs> it's an instrument is just to give us some um, leverage uh, it's for our backflow preventers and our reports that we have to keep on file for the Department of Natural Resources. No discussion. Okay, go ahead, Sherry. In ordinance amending section 700.140 of the Code of the City of Washington, Missouri, and adding thereto two new sections, 700.141 and 700.142. Holtmeyer? Aye. Briggs? Yes. Wessels? Aye. Patkey? Yes. Coulter? Yes. Bayer? Yes. Hydrich? Aye. By your vote, ordinance 7H passes. Aye, please. In order to amending section 700.320 of the Code of the City of Washington, Missouri. Hydrich. Introduced by Hydrich. Yes, and this one is just to uh, bring all the fees into one house to be paid for. Um, the connection fees, tap fees, materials, water meter, all that stuff into one, into one stop for the developers, residents, contractors. Right, yeah. So. yeah. Go ahead, Sherry. In ordinance amending section 700.320 of the Code of the City of Washington, Missouri. Holtmeyer? Aye. Briggs? Yes. Wessels? Aye. Patkey? Yes. Coulter? Yep. Bayer? Yes. Hydrich? Aye. By your vote, ordinance 7I passes. J, please. An ordinance, for, an, ordinance providing the, an ordinance providing for the approval and acceptance of minimum, minimum improvements for maintenance for the, the Creek at Coke Farm subdivision in the city of Washington, Franklin County, Missouri. Holtmar. Introduced by Holtmar. So this is uh, that we've inspected all the minimal improvements for the Creek at Coke Farm subdivision and uh, begin entering the two-year maintenance contract. Just, just for clarification for the council, once the improvements have been put in, the uh, contractor is required in order for us to accept those improvements and take over maintenance of those improvements mainly, uh, they have to go ahead and present a 20% bond for any maintenance for, that's good for two years. So that road's open now. That road is open. But this would make it officially ours. Yes. And allow us to start issuing building permits. We have already received re requests for building permits on these lots, but okay. you can't do that till it's city street. Mm -hmm. Other discussion, guys. Other questions. Yes. <laughs> it's exciting. Breaking the law. Go ahead, Chair. An ordinance providing for the approval and acceptance of minimum improvements for maintenance for the Creek at Coke Farm subdivision in the city of Washington, Franklin County, Missouri. Holtmeyer? Aye. Briggs? Yes. Wessels? Aye. Patkey? Yes. Coulter? Yes. Bayer? Yes. Hydrich? Aye. By your vote, Ordinance 7J passes. Okay, please. An ordinance authorizing and directing the acceptance of a general release and settlement agreement by and between the City of Washington, Missouri and KIST LLC. Holtmar. Introduced by Holtmar. This was brought to your attention uh, that uh, the council in executive session decided, discussed, uh, to go ahead and do the settlement with KIST LLC. It's for the old Egan building. There is, um, this was the city did a conduit project back in 2018, Bury the Electric. Whenever it rained, there was water coming off the southern wall of the building. Uh, you agreed at that time to go ahead and pay for that repair and then release the city from any further liability. Discussion. Okay, go ahead. An ordinance authorizing and directing the acceptance of a general release and settlement agreement by and between the City of Washington, Missouri and KIST LLC. Holtmeyer? Aye. Briggs? Yes. Wessels? Aye. Patkey? Yes. Coulter? Yes. Bayer? Yes. Hydrich? Aye. Okay, L, please. A resolution authorizing the City of Washington, Missouri to apply for funding through the Franklin County Transportation Committee for the Third Street Overlay and Improvements Project in the City of Washington, Franklin County, Missouri. As Charles explained in the workshop previous to the meeting or whatever, this just gives us approval to go ahead and apply for the funds over Franklin County. It's a competitive process between other cities and Franklin County for transportation projects. Uh, we would be applying for 100,000 
Uh, the applications are due, I believe, in July. Is that correct? Yep. And Charles is here if you have any questions. Will you submit the application, Charles? Yes. Good man. <laughs> He'll do it if you pass the resolution. <laughs> that was a stipulation. That's good. Continue to do that. <laughs> We'll go for every day, every penny. Absolutely. <laughs> I need a motion, guys. Keep doing your job. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Motion by Patkey, second by Holtmeyer. All those in favor say aye. 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 That's an easy one. Thanks, Charles. Resolution L passes. Commission, committee, and board reports. An ordinance approving the final plat of Stonecrest Subdivision Plat 18 <coughs> in the city of Washington, Franklin County, Missouri. Holtmeyer. Introduced by Holtmeyer. As you'll remember a couple, I think it was two months ago, we had this plat before you for, uh, for approval. However, at that time, there was not a performance agreement in place. Uh, the city has been negotiating with that property owner on that roadway to connect from Earthcrest Drive all the way over to Rabbit Trail Drive. Uh, however, in the interim, they would like to go ahead and close on these two lots. Uh, we required that a performance bond be in place since there's no other agreement in place. And so this time they do have the performance bond to go ahead and build the street for that portion. Discussion. All right, go ahead, Sherry. An ordinance approving the final plat of Stonecrest Subdivision Plat 18 in the city of Washington, Franklin County, Missouri. Holtmeyer? Aye. Briggs? Yes. Wessels? Aye. Patkey? Yes. Coulter? Yes. Bear? Yes. Heitrich? Aye. Aye. Yay. Ordinance 8 Alpha passes. B, please. An ordinance approving the final plat of WW Industrial Park, Plat 3, in the city of Washington, Franklin County, Missouri. Holtmeyer. Introduced by Holtmeyer. This is a final plat that's along WW uh, Industrial Park, but it also, the, one of the lots that's uh, proposed extends all the way over to uh, Bluff Road. I believe they've got the appropriate easement to get to. Yeah, it. so their, uh, their preliminary plat was reviewed uh, by Plain Zoning Commission and you all uh, a couple months ago. The one stipulation was for that 20 foot road to become a 26 foot um, easement in order to have a, a pr appropriate fire lane to the rear. And this final plat that has now been submitted shows um, the appropriate easement. So, I recommend approval. Sal, can it be said who the uh, applicant is for this? Sure. They yep. were here. They are here. Uh, Jack Flash. Okay. <laughs> that's not his name. That's the name of the company. <laughs> James Fortner with Wartman Fortner. Right. And this is just the request for the final approval. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Sherry. <clears throat> in order to approving the final plat of WW Industrial Park, Plat 3, in the city of Washington, Franklin County, Missouri. Holtmeyer? Aye. Briggs? Yes. Wessels? Aye. Patkey? Yes. Coulter? Yes. Bear? Yes. Heidrich? Aye. By your vote, Ordinance uh, 8B passes. Mayor's report? Okay. Um, the biggie, you guys, is Dwayne's alive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Quite frankly. Thank God he is. So go by and see him when you get time. Keep him in your thoughts and prayers on more business. Uh, stuff. Our next council meeting is June the 20th due to the Juneteenth holiday on Monday the 19th. And uh, I'd like to open up some discussion, if you will, about uh, July the 3rd versus July the 4th. No. Fourth is a holiday. Well, I just, yeah, the, the other option would, the option I think that Sherry wanted to send the email out is okay. one, to make sure that we had a quorum for July 3rd due to its close proximity to the holiday. There you go. And if you couldn't, if we didn't have a quorum, that was fine. We would move those items on to your second meeting in July, which is July 17th. But it makes no difference. We will, uh, City Hall is open that day. It's not a holiday for us by on the July 3rd. July 4th is, that's not a big deal. But with it close proximity, we just want to make sure that we had five people here for a quorum because if we do put items on here and people are waiting for those, items we didn't want to have a situation where we didn't have a quorum your honor i will not be available on the third okay available you will not chad okay joe's shaking. me either no that's five right there if russ comes or if Dwayne comes i could go either way i'd prefer not but i could go i could be here yes i can be 
I'm in. I'm with Mike. Right. <laughs> if, if we can get it all into the second meeting. We, I, I will say, family time the, only, the only thing I will tell you, I, we discussed this at the department head meeting this morning. There is nothing that they're aware of that's, that's that pressing. Uh, I may have something at the, at the airport. Um, we could put it on hold in case we, something comes up. And if nothing comes up, then we could just delay everything until the 17th. It's up to you guys. That's a good one. Makes sense. Delay. Is that a plan? Yep. So you're going to say no meeting unless something comes up, then you're proposing Correct. a meeting. Correct. I think that's a good idea. Great. That's a real good idea. So when will we know? Yeah, in case you want to I know. will. Uh, I did. This, 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 <laughs> this all sounded great until uh, CMT, our consultant for the airport, called me about an issue today. Uh, I will know by middle part of next week. We'd have to post it a week in advance anyway. So. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'd give you plenty of, plenty of notice. So we'd have one, two, three, four. We'd have to have... He'll be here. Dwayne here He'll for that. He'll be here. Okay. Let's quit being a wimp. He should have been here tonight. <laughs> you guys, I would like I to add one more wow. thing here. I hope he is, too. <laughs> Are you watching, Dwayne? One more thing, everybody. Um, the young woman who addressed us this evening. Um, let me choose my words right carefully here. Believe me when I tell you that her situation has been under consideration for a long time. It was not in any way, shape, or form taken lightly at all. Um, and so just be aware that, one, I am sorry you had to witness that. Um, it was not easy. That's right. It's a public meeting, and she deserves her day to state her views. And uh, I'm just sorry that you guys had to hear that. It was tough for us, too. Thank you. Your Honor, if I may, we did not destroy that woman's house for no reason. Let it be known. It was not for no reason, as she stated. Thank you. City Administrator's report? No report. We do have a few items for executive session. Council comments? Anybody else, guys? Okay. Motion to adjourn. City Attorney's report? Public vote on whether or not to hold the closed <laughs> meeting to discuss nice personnel. Legal and real estate matters pursuant to section 610.021 RSMO 2000. Holtmeyer? Aye. Briggs? Aye. Wessels? Aye. Patkey? No. Holter? Yes. Bear? Yes. In honor of Dwayne, I'll say you betcha. <laughs> <laughs>